The Town of Farmington. Respecting history, planning the future. To order at 6.32. And if we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you again for taking some time to uh, join us this evening for uh, the third set of presentations. So tonight we will be discussing the new building conceptual options. Uh, the third in our series having, we have already uh, reviewed the maintain options, the renovate options, and now again we'll, we'll have a discussion on those new concepts tonight. Before we started, this might look familiar to everybody. Um, I did review this very briefly last week, but for those who might be joining us uh, for the first time tonight or haven't had an opportunity to take a look at um, the video, the Nutmeg TV video, uh, this is just a, a very high level overview of our project timeline to, to give everybody an understanding of where we are in this process. So this very first phase that we're in, which is conceptual option phase, again, as I mentioned, maintain, renovate, and new. Um, and, and we're here in this process. This is a good opportunity for us to get feedback from the community um, based on priorities that we see as well as um, combining that with what we understand to be the statement of needs um, from the Board of Education for this facility. So it's a very import important pr part of the process and we're glad that you're here um, to help us uh, walk through that tonight. So after we actually complete these options and, and review them, we will, as we keep mentioning, come back to um, the meeting with a, a recommendation based on the information that we've seen so far. And with that recommendation, we will go to town council. And that meeting is scheduled for February 4th right now for us to have a, a presentation to town council um, based on all this information. And at that point, we hand that information over. And the town council's responsibility at that point is to set what's called a net municipal project cost range and project scope. So they'll come back after doing their evaluation to give us a better understanding on the overall cost and scope of the project. At that point, once that's been set, we are actually recharged as a committee to go back to the drawing table, literally, and work on schematic design. So getting more detail into those plans. So that might be one of the questions you have as we walk through these. It's very high level, and, and I keep referring to them as conceptual designs. There's a lot more work to be done once we've decided a direction which we're gonna go. So once we complete that schematic design phase, we, we move on to step four, and that's that town meeting referendum, which is now scheduled for October of this year. So long process, a lot of work's been done to this point, but kind of keep that in mind where we are in the process um, as we move through it. So with that level set, a couple other uh, notes that I wanna make tonight. Remind everybody about the community meeting that we have scheduled for Saturday. So. This is a really important meeting as well, very informal. It's gonna be right here in the high school. You will have the opportunity to come and review kind of large poster boards, more information around these conceptual options. All six will be presented. We will have representation from the architectural firms there. You have the opportunity at that point to ask questions. Ask questions of the architects, ask questions of us. We will have representation there. I know as a community member sitting in your seats, sometimes it's hard in these meetings to listen to all this information and not be able to kind of have a dialogue with the people who are presenting, this is the opportunity to do that. So please, if you can, take that opportunity. It's scheduled for this Saturday, 9 to 12. Very informal, it's a drop-in community event. You can come have conversation. We're offering tours again of the high school on the hour. So, and it's, it's family friendly, please. Anybody who wants to come can come and attend, ask questions, and it's a really good opportunity to just take another look and ask more questions. So please keep that in mind. The other piece that I just wanna remind everybody, if you do come up for public comment tonight, we've been very successful in having people watch either the live streaming video or the Nutmeg TV videos that have been posted, but it's very important that we all 
talk into the microphone so that we can everybody can hear not only in the back of the room but in those videos so committee members I know it's hard sometimes we kind of share microphones up here pull them closer to you make sure you you really clear as well if you do as you're doing public comments and architects as well as you're presenting if you could kind of get as close as you can so we can get really good audio that would be helpful as well okay so at this time, I'm actually going to open the floor to first public comment. Do you remember there is a second public comment opportunity after the presentations are completed? Hello, my name is Sam. I live in Three Hidden Spring Lane. Because I am in fifth grade, I have some experience with Farmington Public Schools. The thing that makes Farmington Schools so special is that everybody there is so kind. I also like Westwoods because the classrooms are very modern and we do not have to worry about having not enough space for clubs or working together with other kids. The problem I am bringing to hand is the fact that Farmington High School is not as nice as the other schools like Westwoods or, and East Farms. So what I'm asking for you is that you choose an option that not only fixes the problem at hand, but makes the solution for it even better. This means that there are enough special education spots that all the students can learn. It means that the environment allows everybody to work together. It should include air conditioning and heat because it's hard to work when you're too hot or too cold. It means that people with disabilities should be able to make it throughout the building. The reason I am saying this is because we want farming to schools to be special for everyone. We hope the future Future education for all children is bright is a bright one in a nice building. I hope you take to mind what I said. Hello. My name is Daria Lee. I live at 3 Hamilton Way. I'm a peer of Sam. I want to go to a high school in which I can learn well, and that is safe and secure. Random pieces of tile falling from the ceiling, I'm afraid, isn't safe or secure. The many programs that Farmington High School ha offer are amazing, but if we don't even have enough room to run them all, that's a problem. I'm speaking on behalf of myself, my eighth grade sister, and my third grade brother. Even if he is sometimes annoying, he deserves a good education in school as much as I do. The upper elementary school is in better shape than our high school is. Even though we have amazing schools, this needs to be repaired. I would really like for this to happen. Even if it doesn't concern your family, it does concern your neighbors and the person who's speaking right now on behalf of it. For repairs, this should last at least a couple of decades so other kids don't have to make a public comment to help people realize this concerns the rest of our lives. Not only that, but a comprehensive solution that fixes everything, not just one or two problems. I really hope Farmington can help the next couple of generations out. Hello. My name is Roosevelt, uh, Fairbrother. I live at 12 Candlewood Lane. I'm going to high school in four years. When I go to high school, I want to have a good building with a nice cafeteria, a good auditorium, and a good wheel wheelchair accessible building all around. I love signs, and I would, like, I would like to have a great science classroom that benefits everyone and has the right lab gear. Also, no one is stepping up for our high school. We need to do that. Every, everyone knows we will get a new high school sooner or later, but this is our chance. We need to step up. Hi. Hi. My name is Finnegan. I am 11 years old and live at 12 Candlewood Land. I have always had a love for theater, but the auditorium is not wheelchair accessible or crutch accessible. So these people can't go to plays. If there's a class they have in there, they can't do that. But for any reason, they, uh, they have to go in there, they can't. So therefore, they can't participate in these activities. Hello, my name is Victoria and I live at 9 Timberbrook Road. We support a long-term comprehensive solution such as those being discussed tonight. Our community needs a facility that will serve students such as ourselves, educators and residents for decades to come. Our ability to compete and contribute to our world at large has begun right here in Farmington tonight. 
It has been said by some educators that the environment is the third teacher, which means agreeing to a more flexible environment, helping us to gain the skills needed, helping us to get jobs in the 21st century workforce, offering modern and up-to-date spaces for research, music, athletics, and collaboration, giving us students more time to learn and less time to race around a sprawling building, and providing a safe structure and work environment so we can focus on learning and not crazy events out of our control. Our town has the power to make this right choice the right time around. Let's rise to the occasion and support youth such as ourselves with the comprehensive, comprehensive solution so that our entire community can ben benefit. As they say, the rising tide lifts all boats. All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Jake Breckner, and I'm a senior here at uh, Farmington High School. And I've been here for four years, and uh, I've definitely loved every part of it. Um, I totally agree with everything these five kids are saying. Um, fully, I can't wait until they experience high school. It's going to be an awesome time for them. And I totally agree with uh, the state of the auditorium. Uh, my sophomore year, I did an empowerment project for my government and law class. Um, and I researched um, specific aspects of the auditorium, like handicap accessibility and uh, the acoustics, uh, the science behind that, and everything down to the number of seats and the number of broken seats that are replaced by the ones you're sitting in right now. <coughs> Uh, our town is very proud of our string program. I have played the cello since se second grade. And shout out to Janet Fantazzi. Um, <laughs> when I arrived at the high school, I was very excited to continue playing for this orchestra. Currently, I'm in Symphony Strings, and it's a very fun group. It's the top group, and uh, we have a very talented group of m musicians. People come here to play an instrument, or sing, or do theater in our auditorium. Um, I'm disappointed that we do not have a facility that supports our ex excellent music program. We are one of the best in the state, and I fully believe in everything our school does. Our music department is well known for its excellence. However, all of the surrounding towns have auditoriums that support their performing arts. Our auditorium is obviously acoustically deficient and not adequate for our program. As a college applicant, it is possible that some people may want to send recordings of their concerts that they have uh, held in their in the auditorium. And uh, acoustically, it's not the best area, so they have to give them give the colleges more. Uh, we have a couple musicians in the orchestra that are really trying to put do push for that. Uh, this year, our orchestra performed at the University of Hartford. Uh, in Lincoln Center, which is a beautiful uh, arena for orchestras and bands. Um, and, it, and it was absolutely eye-opening to hear what we could potentially sound like. I implore you to consider a renovation of our auditorium and one will, that will serve our school and music program. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Marcus Fairbrother, 12 Candlewood Lane. These guys uh, really outshine me tonight, so I shouldn't even be bothering with this. But um, I want to say, uh, some of my colleagues from Comprehensive FHS were here last week. Uh, last week, I wasn't able to make it. Um, we are. As they, if you were here last week and you heard them speak, we're a group of concerned and engaged citizens who are actively uh, supporting this project, and we want to be able to help uh, bring home to a successful referendum school project, but one that is comprehensive in its solution, not just any project. Um, we, all, oh, Meg, we have um, some clipboards sign up if anyone's interested. Is it okay if we circulate those? It's okay. Okay, thank you. Um, you can just sign up. We, uh, we have an email distribution list, and we'll send updates and, and stuff. Um, I want to talk a little bit about something um, that not a lot of people have talked about, and I think that it's, this is really an emotional issue. Um, and I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that it's, it's nothing less than the future of our community here that's, that's, that's at stake. Uh, various times in this process, 
I've heard some remarkable statements made by informed, thoughtful, uh, and intelligent people. At an early 2019 meeting, former Board of Education Chairman and current Town Councilor Chris Fagan said that Farmington, quote, faces an existential crisis, end quote, uh, with the current facility and how we address it. Uh, this past fall, I was at a, an FHS uh, Building Committee Communications Subcommittee meeting, and Superintendent Kathy Greeter said, quote, the building is affecting teaching and learning every day, end quote. At another subcommittee meeting, um, current Board of Education Chairperson Ellen Sayuda said, quote, there are disruptions to our kids' education now every day. It's not just renovation or construction in the future that could create disruptions, end quote. Dr. Scott Hurwitz, principal of FHS, has said several times that the administration, faculty, and staff have gone out of their way and done an incredible job to minimize those disruptions, but that it's simply not a sustainable solution. Numerous short-term solutions in the past have gotten us to where we are today, a failing facility that doesn't meet the needs or even the standards of today, let alone help us plan for the future, whatever that may bring. We simply cannot afford to do the same again. Such an approach would be irresponsible. It's the definition of poor stewardship of the town's funds and the taxpayers' hard-earned money, and it's a violation of the promises we've made to our students to successfully prepare them for a full life after school, and to the residents of Farmington to have a bright, vibrant community full of opportunity. Times change, the nature of work has changed, the average person's lifestyle has changed. Our current FH facility has not. Actually, that's not entirely true. It's gotten worse. Farmington needs an FHS building that allows us to fully implement the curriculum we've carefully designed to educate our students to meet not just today's challenges, but also those of our rapidly changing future as well. Let me reiterate that our current building does not do this. It's not just me, it's not just comprehensive FHS, it's not just the parents and the grandparents of school age kids, but it's the voters of Farmington who demand a comprehensive solution. Anything less is simply unacceptable. We cannot change the past, but we can shape the future. And the future I want to see is a bright, vibrant, and proud Farmington. Members of the FHS Building Committee, the next step is in your hands. As Chris Fagan said, we are at an existential crisis. Think of the students, think of the town, think of now and think of the future. Make us proud. Do the right thing and choose a comprehensive solution. Thank you. Hello, my name is Leanne Fenton. I live at 3 Long Ridge Court. My husband and I moved to Farmington from out of state two and a half years ago with our two daughters. The number one reason we chose Farmington was for the well-rated schools. I think Farmington residents should be proud of its reputation, of its education, and it should seek to retain this reputation. To remain competitive in the educational realm, Farmington needs to resolve the issues of this high school. At the time we moved here, we did not know the high school was and is falling apart. We did not know that there was a referendum or that it had just failed. Some new friends had educated us on this issue. Had we known then what we know now, I can say in all honesty, we would not have moved to Farmington. Education, safety, and the health of our daughters are our top priorities. We feel that sending our daughters to the high school as is as it might be under the maintain option or the renovate as new option would be negligent. We support the option that best meets the full statements of needs for the high school under NEASC. Anything short of this is a disservice to all students. I hope the town sees the importance of a comprehensive solution not only for my daughters, but for students whose parents are not comfortable speaking in public for students whose parents are not able to make these meetings, for students whose parents do not know these issues exist. Sadly, there are some in our town who are not aware. 
for students who deserve to be well educated in a safe and responsible environment. In short, for all students of Farmington. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tatiana Machado, 20 in Wood Lane, and I stand before you as a Farmington resident, but someone who's involved in higher education. So I thought I'd uh, just share a couple things. Um, I had a, stud a son who just graduated. Uh, he's now at UConn, and I cannot say how fabulous the education from kinder all, uh, kindergarten all the way to 12th grade is in town. It's fantastic. I also have a son that's gonna be a freshman in the fall. So I've been attending events at Farmington High School and as Jake pointed out, and I know Jake because I used to sub at IAR, um, I have it down pat, I know in the auditorium which are the broken seats. So we always know which row to get into because we know where the broken seats are and that's quite a shame. Uh, my older son started violin in second grade just like Jake and um, he's been doing it ever since and doing it in college as well. So I have an inside perspective as a substitute, but also I am employed by Tunxis Community College, which is right in our backyard here. And oftentimes I get students from Farmington and they're wonderful. What I would like to say is that I'm not, of course, I'm preaching to the choir here and I know that all of you are being informed, but there's a lot of people in town that aren't informed and vote just based on the sticker price of something. And my background is I'm a business faculty at Tunxis and I'm also the program coordinator there. And uh, I do informal research, specifically at the bus stop, because I always think that at the bus stop is sort of like the water cooler situation. And oftentimes people see the price and that's how they vote. Um, and so they don't come to events like this. They don't have an inside perspective. I remember the first time um, I received a picture from my son that he texted me about it raining in his lab, which I thought, wow, uh, I didn't know those were the conditions inside the school. For those of you that have par um, children at Farmington High School, you can't forget the fact that when you come here on open house, and it's usually a warm September afternoon or evening, that you're in the 1928 building and it's probably 90 degrees in there and then you walk over to the 900 and it's about 50, right? Because the HVAC doesn't work. Um, I already talked about the broken seats and also who can forget the um, wonderful district-wide events that we have, either chorus, concert, or band, but the gymnasium, how hot does it get in there? Very much so, so I think a solution is very well needed. I also wanna talk about um, the NEASC component of it. So NEASC is the New England um, schools and colleges. Um, they give you an accreditation status. I just went through accrediting our program at the school. It's like being audited by the IRS except worse. And um, when NEASC gives you an unfavorable rating, it's a big deal to turn that ship around. So uh, I moved to Farmington 21 years ago. Because of the education, I feel that my oldest has received that education, is going on to you know, higher ed, and I'm sure that my fresh, incoming freshman will too. But what would be nice is that the facilities would match sort of that education that they're getting. And so I think that what I'm trying to do, say is be, let's be prudent in, so, in sort of what we choose um, so we don't have a repeat of what happened last time because I think that people often, you know, uh, my background is marketing and I know that people are price sensitive. So I think that's important to keep in, in the back of your mind. Thank you. Uh, good evening, I'm uh, Pierre Gurton from uh, 12 Henley Commons here in Farmington. Um, I didn't intend to stock a young woman who was uh, in front of me. So, um, 
And some may, I'm glad everybody's here, you as I probably felt this was a better place to be than taking in all this impeachment crap that's on TV these days. So uh, probably still be going on next week. But no, this is a very serious subject. And um, everybody's got a lot of different views. Um, those were evident a few years ago when this last, uh, the last approach failed. And um, you know, I think this process is built fairly well, but I do think there are risks for failing again. And I guess I want to speak to that a little bit um, tonight. Um, many thanks to the building committee and the professionals that have been providing uh, very creative options. I've been a little dismayed and, and perhaps have been more hopeful that everybody can stay a bit open-minded. Um, we've got some very extreme views and some very premature reactions to proposals when all the proposals haven't even been aired yet. Uh, we have some who seem to have clearly written off the notion that any sort of renovation for any part of the school is not reasonable or perhaps consistent with a prudent decision. Uh, and at the same time, there are others, not I, um, that believe not much needs to be done, okay? Um, and, you know, the reality is we need to do something, but we need to do something that we can collectively determined to be a prudent and a responsible proposal for this town, or it will not succeed. And overheated rhetoric isn't necessarily going to convey uh, folks' uh, concerns and, and the like. So um, I want to talk a little bit about this notion of sprawl. I've heard it a lot. And I think it's just a bit overstated in my view from a criteria perspective, okay? Um, any building approaching a quarter of a million square feet by definition involves sprawl, okay? I went to a high school with 3,000 students, okay? It was big. It took several minutes to get from point A to point B, but that happens to be reality. We're building a school presumably for some 13, 14, hundred students and stacking the square footage on multiple floors just in my mind just reorients the sprawl it's not horizontal anymore it's vertical and candidly I'm not sure stairways are a preference for solving congestion versus hallways but I'm not an architect um, but most importantly I'm a little concerned about the timeline for coming to a proposed recommendation. If the committee is taking in this information on the three proposals at the same time we are, I don't understand how in 10 to 12 days you can sufficiently vet, compare, contrast, you name what needs to be done in order to make an informed, fully supported, articulated recommendation and be able to defend it with the level of knowledge and detail that I think is going to be important for that to get off on the right start. I'm also struck, and I know this is a competitive process, and I appreciate the competing views of the two architectural firms. I find that compelling and, and of considerable value. Um, but arguably, and I understand the competitive process, they've undertaken these projects in a vacuum there's been more than enough comments being made by both. Well, had we or could we talk about it with administration, with the committee, perhaps things like elapsed time and, and how educational criteria and objectives might be better met in any particular design might be better understood. And I don't see anything in this timeline that provides for that kind of constructive dialogue. Now, Perhaps there are limitations in the context of a competitive process, um, and, and obviously council can provide that to you. But, I mean, I've been working on a home addition of 1,100 square feet with my architect for three plus months, and every time it comes back, it gets better. Um, so I, I just caution us to be careful about that. We're going to have six options out there. And when that comes up under discussion, there's going to be some tough questions. 
and there appropriately should be. And my view in the past is the last attempt failed, one, because of cost, but more importantly, I think there were other issues that never were, never in my view and many others' view, adequately addressed. For example, there was no substantive consideration of a new school on an alternate site. There was unresolved consideration of important issues with our abutting neighbors. We had no good reason described for exceeding the town's debt service targets. We were planning on putting multi-million dollar cost into a 1928 building to be used for office space and otherwise be substantially underutilized for the core mission, which is education. If one believes this campus is so substantially beyond hope, how can we reconcile keeping the oldest 92-year-old building? And we are also going to be destructing and or repurposing more recent school expansions that we're still paying bond debt service on. So I just caution you, if, if possible, to, to take more time to really think about, you know, when you make that recommendation at the council, how are you going to justify, how are you going to support it as being the most appropriate uh, accomplishment of educational objectives as well as the most pre reasonable value-oriented proposals uh, for the taxpayers. So they're going to be tough questions and if we don't have good answers, which I felt we didn't have, and I say we, as, I'm sorry, as a town, then we're not going to get a successful outcome. And I just want to speak quickly on fiscal matters. I know we haven't asked the architects to design things within the context of a cost profile. But those costs and that burden is real. And you've been describing, for example, last week's renovate as $490 to the average assessed home in town. On the surface, doesn't seem like a lot. But that alone, for that average home, is nearly an 8% increase in their annual taxes. And if we were to have a roughly $120 to $150 increase in otherwise assessed expenditures because of all the other town, we're talking over a 10% increase. So that's not insignificant, OK? And so I just caution us, take, take more time if necessary, because I really don't see us being in a, in a position. I, I can't wrap my head around all six and tell you what I think. And um, I think you guys should consider taking a little bit more time. Sorry, I've taken too much time. Thank you. Uh, Chad Williams, uh, 17 Westview Terrace. Um, so I wanted to speak, um, so I'm in higher education, uh, um, work at C um, Central Connecticut State University, and I just wanted to speak towards the importance of maintaining the accreditation that we have. Um, you may not realize that it's a huge deal to our students in terms of they graduate. The number of scholarships that they have available to them goes down significantly if they don't come from an accredited high school. So it's critical that you maintain that in terms of both attracting teachers here, but also in terms of enabling our students to get to the education they want to after uh, Farmington High School. Um, another thing I wanted to speak to is um, any option that we consider, that we make sure that we consider the ADA um, compliance, which multiple people have spoken to, um, but also equity in terms of other aspects of our school. So some people may not be aware of this, but currently our locker rooms are completely insufficient for athletics. So the boys' teams have the athletic, the athletic locker room for the fall semester, and the girls' teams have no athletic locker room whatsoever and have to make do with the old locker room. In the um, spring semester, they essentially have to split with um, the boys and girls, but we aren't um, uh, being Title IX compliant and supporting our, our girls' teams. We need to be supporting everybody equally among our uh, campus. Um, looking at the solutions that were prevented for the renovate solutions on, on last time, um, I don't want to be uh, hypercritical of what was presented, but one of the things that caught my eye was with the QA and M renovate option that was presented, the brand new facility was all nestled right into the elevation gains that we have on this back end, right at the back of the building. It's not sort of thinking of everything that we've seen with the current building. So regardless of how well we plan this time, 20, 30 years down the line, we're going to have to expand once again. If the entire learning space is at the back of that building, there's no place to 
to continue to grow on what the elevation gain. So you're forced to put the, um, the growth on the parking lot side, in which case, once again, you have sprawl. Um, looking at the other option, the learning space was on the parking lot side, so you have the ability to continue to grow, put another three-story building next to that, and you don't run into that same sprawl issue. So regardless of which solution, I would um, urge the, the group to basically think about, we're going to have to grow again in 20 to 30 years. So think about a solution that puts yourself in a place that you have the ability to do so without running into all the same issues that we uh, currently have once again. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Hudfagner. I live at 4 Deepwood Road. I'm here tonight to share my support for a comprehensive solution for this building project. The statement of need, as mentioned earlier, approved by the Board of Education, very clearly defines what is necessary for this project. The statement of need is not a statement of wants, where we as a community can pick and choose the items we want to address. We really need to address all these issues, and I think the time is now. We need to address accreditation and accessibility. We need to address security and compliance. We need to address the sprawling layout, which includes overcrowded hallways. We need to address the educational program, which includes ad inadequate classroom space. And we need to address the code compliance and energy efficient issues. Again, in, in my opinion, the maintain options presented two weeks ago don't really get us all of those statement of needs. I was encouraged by last week, and I look forward to tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Patty Boy Williams, 7 Westview Terrace. People move to Farmington for two reasons, low taxes, good schools. For some reason, it's always listed in that order when I hear people discussing it. I've been known to say it in that order as well. And yet, even with our low taxes, people are choosing not to move to Farmington right now because of the state of our high school. I have colleagues that have been looking that are deciding where to move. They've chosen Avon, Simsbury, Glastonbury because they don't like Farmington High School and the thought of their children attending. As many of you know, I have a ninth grader and a seventh grader, and I did move to Farmington because of the schools. We have phenomenal schools, we have great teachers, and my children have received an excellent education. But my ninth grader walks through school with her arms up like this because it's the only way to get through the hallways without being jostled and to make sure she can get to where she needs to go. We need to do better by our students. Our community deserves better. This is our community emergency shelter. This space can, is used for Farmington Continuing Ed. It serves a plethora of services, and yet it cannot reach its full potential in its current condition. These conditions significantly limit the learning experience, and they limit the ability of the community to come and enjoy cultural programs, whether it's the Farmington Valley Symphony Orchestra, dance recitals, or other such activities that could be held here. I look forward to seeing tonight's presentations. I trust that you as the building committee will deliberate and evaluate all of the options to ensure that we provide a comprehensive solution for, F for FHS. We need to ensure that we address the full statement of needs. We need to make sure that we have addressed all of the issues that have been raised by others here tonight, ADA compliance, Title IX issues, the auditorium, the sprawl, and making sure that we have a modern classroom. Thank you for your time, both tonight and for your service. Hi, um, Sam Reisner, 41 Main Street. And I, again, thank you also for your time. This has been a long process I've been watching and coming and you know it's great to see so many people here tonight I encourage you to bring your friends next week uh, come speak share your thoughts this is the time to provide that comment because once town council makes their second charge there's a process there's a chance for input but it's pretty set so if you think you want something or you think something is important 
please come speak. Please come share those thoughts. Send them to the committee. Really, they're responsive, and I've found that really great. So um, just a couple comments. What I've heard about the sprawl is it's not just the sprawl. What we've seen is it is that those hallways are narrow. They're not designed for the sprawl and the throughput that's there. So that's a big challenge. Um, but really, uh, ADA compliance, universal design is a really great thing. When you see it in action, it's all over, or not here, but outside of this building. It's fantastic to see. And uh, I really hope that a comprehensive solution can really help serve the entire community. So do get involved. Reach out for information. Check out Comprehensive FHS uh, Facebook page. We live stream. I'm sitting back there helping make that happen. Uh, really share that with your friends. Bring them out next week. Uh, this public comment has gone on for a while, but I think it's really important. So I really encourage you to bring, bring your friends. Any additional public comment at this time? Oh, okay, we were waiting for you, Fim, sorry. Uh, okay, so we're actually gonna move on to a couple uh, housekeeping, housekeeping items before we um, start the presentation. So our next order of business is actually to approve uh, the meeting minutes. So can I get a motion to approve the attached January 15, 2020 minutes? Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> okay, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? All right, unanimously approved. Next order of business is correspondence and reports. Oh, I hit the button. Um, the only thing we have included our agenda, in our agenda packet is um, correspondence from Jay Tulin, um, some comments that he had around uh, the Renovate presentations and the Friends program as it relates to that. So that is included in the agenda packet and will uh, be posted online for your review. So at this time, I think we are ready to actually move right into the presentations. So just as a quick reminder to uh, both the architects and to uh, the audience, just the format of the presentations, these are 35-minute presentations that we do time to make sure every, each architect has equal opportunity to speak. We have a five-minute financial review that CSG, our owner's rep, uh, provides following that presentation, and then an opportunity for questions and answers from the committee to the architects at that point for any further clarification. Uh, then we move into the second presentation from there. And then, as I mentioned before, we'll have a second opportunity for public comment uh, as well after you've heard the presentations. Uh, first presentation tonight uh, will be from QA&M. Ready to go? We, yep. You guys have right. the floor. You're all set. There we go. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dave Quisenberry. I'm the founding principal of QA&M Architecture. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I also want to speak directly to to each of you that have spe spoken this evening and at public meetings over the past several months. I want you to know that I hear what you're saying and I agree with you about the need for a comprehensive solution and the concerns about the deficiencies for the existing FHS facility. Like many of you, I moved to this town specifically for the educational experience. 21 years ago, when my oldest child was getting ready to start kindergarten, my wife Jennifer and I moved to Farmington specifically for the schools. Six years ago, I attended my last East Farms year-end picnic, 15 years straight. I think that's kind of a town record, probably. <laughs> I think we outlasted Mr. Galuzzo on that one. <laughs> so uh, my partner, Rusty Malik, has a similar experience, moving to this town 30 years ago. You know, so from soccer with Al Bell to strings camp with David Kramer, we've experienced this community in all its glory. This, we have given a lot to our community and our community has given a lot to us. Um, this project, the way we see it, is kind of the paragon of our ability to give back to our community. Um, we can 
it gives us the opportunity to further the excellent educational outcomes for all the students. It allows us to potentially attract new people to the town of Farmington. And it also provides an environment for learning that our children deserve. Um, tonight's option three presentation, which is a new high school, represents the final presentation of this conceptual design phase. This scheme permits the design teams, you know, the, the other design team as well, to present to you an idea basically starting from a blank sheet of paper. And it, what this represents is our vision for the town of Farmington and the future of the town of Farmington. <coughs> Excuse me. So Ru my partner Rusty will now go on and discuss the site plan, which is something that's kind of unique about a new building option versus a renovation option in that we have to determine where the school is actually located. Thank you, David. So just to orient everybody, um, we have Route 4 down here, sort of on the south side of the, of the site. Um, and really what jumps out at you when you look at the site, which is not apparent uh, unless you live in the neighborhood, is on three sides of the high school is, is all neighborhoods, all residential. So, you know, right away, you just need to start thinking, my God, whatever we do, we have to respect the neighborhoods. And that's, that's something that we all need to be uh, aware of. So even though we say, oh, we're building a new school, it's going to be really easy because it's a new school. Not true. You have to think about what the surrounding areas are like. So we started looking at the site, and we really have four options. The first one was put the building right on top of the old building, because that's probably the best location for it, but not viable. Uh, costs, n number of reasons. So then we looked at location A, which is up uh, on the field hockey lacrosse fields. Um, and we know that that's, that was discussed at the last referendum. There were a multitude of reasons, grading, costs, and so on. And so we, we looked at it. How do you circulate around there? There's a, you know, it's really a 60-foot uh, um, increase in, in elevation from, one, from Route 4 all the way up there. So we said, OK, idea. We could put the building there. Not a great location. Then we looked at location B. We said, let's put it on the track because it's further back, it gives us a lot of room for parking in the front. And then we thought about it and said, you know what? I was around when we talked about the lighting on the fields. And we're gonna put the field, the, the track and field somewhere else and then go through that process again? I think not. Um, so, and not to mention the cost of that field also. So we thought about it long and hard, and then we said, okay, let's, let's look at option C. Again, not a slam dunk, but let's take a, a harder look at it. So when we started looking at option C, you know, the first thing that jumped out is that we've got to look at what's the impact on the neighbors. Right away, and you can see by this, this shape right here, you know, this maximizing the distance between the property line and the building is going to be an imperative to this project. We've got to do that. We've got to shift the building. Now there are some parameters here. And one of the parameters is, well, you've got the existing building. And I know uh, we can move as close to the building. If we want to minimize disruption to education, you want to come as close to the building, but you want to be, keep it safe. And so that's extremely important. We have to then think about how we're going to build this building. Where is the staging going to be for construction? How do we keep the kids safe? Because they may be in school, this education may not be disrupted, but construction has an impact on any educational, on the education itself. So you'll notice in, in, in using this approach, we were able to create really a separation. So construction traffic coming up would go to the right and into the construction zone. All school traffic would come up, go to the left, and the entire FHS building would remain. So minimal disruption. Now that's not to say access to the fields is not going to be an issue, um, just access to the building. We're going to have to do things like putting temporary parking, but these are all manageable uh, issues that we can deal with as we build a new school. So we thought long and hard about it, but we believe that that's one of the better locations or the, the best location for the school in this scenario. So what you'll notice here is if we put the building, now if you imagine that the, that the existing school is right in, in this area. 
So what we've done is we placed the school here. Number one issue, traffic, vehicular circulation. The buses and, the, and, and cars come up, the cars go to the right, they come around, drop off the kids, and then exit. The buses come up Monteith, go to the left, go to the side of the building, drop off the student, and exit. Minimal interaction, that's what you want. That's what safety is about on, in terms of school traffic. You have, to, you have to maintain that. And then you do have, we have shown an access road around the building, because once again, emergency vehicles need access around the building. We looked at parking. And what we were able to do with this particular layout is we were able to get 610 parking spaces. That's an improvement you know, by, I think, about 70 or 80 spaces over what's currently there. We were also able to zone the parking. Uh, in, in our option, uh, you can, you'll notice that the, bo the, the Board of Education is within this building. So the district offices have a designated area to park. Student parking, the furthest away, they need the exercise. Faculty closer, they need the exercise too, but, and visitors on, in the front of the building. One of the things you'll notice, that as you come up Monteith, the school will be visible. The main entrance to the school will be right in front of you. And I think that's part of what we miss. When we drive up to the school, nobody knows where to go. So we have to, I mean, not just internally, but even externally, really. So that's what we need to do as we look at this building. <laughs> Some of the improvements, and I'm not going to belabor them, uh, you know, we're looking at things like bioswales and rainwater collection so we can have ponds. These are all uh, program items that can, can be incorporated with the science programs in the school. A small green roof would be, we've used that successfully on, in many occasions. You know, potential photovoltaics on, on, the, on the roof of the, of the buildings. Obviously, when we build this building in this location, the tennis courts have to be relocated, uh, and you're seeing that the tennis courts are new, and, and the JV baseball field would have to be shifted as well. But these are all manageable uh, uh, you know, components of the building, and at the end of the day, we would have a fully accessible f site, and we would have a facility that's brand new with minimal disruption. So here's a, a, a view of the model that, that's up here, just to give you some, uh, some idea of how the building is located. And my partner, David, is going to walk you through the building and describe some of the architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Rusty. One, one, one of the challenges, One of the challenges of designing a, a facility that's specifically for the town of Farmington is really understanding the town and its, and its rich history. As we kept talking about what, what was Farmington and what, you know, what defined Farmington, we realized that the Farmington River is really one of the most important elements in town as far as what defines uh, this town. Um, the, the town of Farmington is here because of the river. I mean, in old days, settlements were, were replaced because of the river. So for the last 375 years that Farmington has been here, the river has been a guiding element to the development of the town. It, from the mill buildings, you know, that still stand in Unionville and, you know, the new, you know, wooden tap along the river, you know, as a restaurant, you know, and, and even just where the village of Farmington is, you know, it's all dictated by the river itself. So we sat down and just very simply napkin sketch to try to figure out what would be the concept that would guide the design of, our, of this new facility so important to the town. And the river was that guiding force. Represented by the blue arrow in this sketch, you know, the river kind of is a journey through this school, much as the current river, the real river, is a journey through our town. Um, in, in, the school, in this school conceptual sketch, what happens is basically the river flows through the school and is flanked by all the, the community spaces and the educational spaces that serve the, the needs of the town, much as our actual town and the Farmington River is flanked by the components of the community. So as Rusty mentioned, now we need to think about the school itself and how it functions and how, and how it, it appears. Excuse me. So as we crest Monteith Drive and we see the school, 
the most important thing to see is that there's a def well-defined entrance to the school. This entrance is, is very clear, it's welcoming, it's inviting. You know, the glass allows light to penetrate deep into the school, um, yet, yet it's, there, there's actually a you know, secure vestibule at the ground level behind that main entrance so that we're safe um, and the students are safe in that facility. Um, but it's, again, very well-defined and welcoming to the people, to not just students, but again, this is a community building. And as the gentleman who expressed concern about the community backing whatever solution we choose, you know, we've got to make sure we understand the community function of this facility. It is not just a school. As, as, we, as we look inside, we realize that our little napkin sketch actually develops very nicely into a layout for a modern educational facility. The river flows through this common area de defined by the, the tan on this sketch, which links all of the, the other elements of it. The administrative area is right up front with a good visibility to the entrance, the parking lot, even the, the drive entrance up Monteith Drive. Um, and then either side of, we have the we have the music department and the auditorium. We have the educational uh, components, the cafeteria area, all flowing downstream to the media center, which really is the hub of the school and the, the main function of this, this facility. One of the things I do want to point out is that our gymnasium, which is to the left of, of the commons there, we took the program which calls for a large gym and a small gym, so essentially three gyms, and by locating them adjacent to each other with a movable partition between them, we're complying with the actual program in terms of space requested, but we've created a space that with the doors open, we've really created essentially a field house. We've created a, a large triple gymnasium that could accommodate you know, major athletic events, tournaments, it could accommodate community events, graduations, things like that. In fact, this school could, that field house with everything opened up could probably accommodate 2,500 to 3,000 people. So it becomes a very major community space. Um, and then the educational uh, wings with the classrooms and everything are towards the rear. Once you come through that main entrance, this is the commons. This is what you see. This is this open area that, that pulls everything together. The auditorium is on the right here, kind of evokes the mill buildings of Unionville that start our journey downstream. You know, it's just defined the brick interior to, relative to those buildings. Plenty of space here for pre-event and post-event gathering. We all know how condensed it is between the gymnasium and the auditorium now, especially if there were events going on simultaneously and you're rushing out, you're trying to find your child after a concert and everybody's bumping into each other. This space is, is roughly three times the width in front of the auditorium that we have now in the high school. The athletic um, facility is behind the curving wall there, so again, if, it, if you were coming for a basketball game or something like that, your, um, that event is over there. The, as you flow down the river and through the space, you go past the eating area, and then eventually you're ending up at the media center, which as I mentioned is the hub of this entire facility, and it's visible when you come in the entrance, it's visible at the other end of this common area. Uh, as Rusty mentioned in the site plan, we've completely isolated parent drop-offs from student drop-offs. Um, so what happens is we have a dedicated student entrance at the rear of the building. When the students come in that entrance, they basically, they're entering the commons from the other end. So what you're looking at here is you can see the main entrance is that glass wall in the distance, and the auditorium is you can see the canopy over the entrance. So you, you enter the building right there, you, you're right at the educational area of the school, and so you have a very quick uh, trip to your classrooms, to your lockers. Most of the lockers obviously are located in the educational portion of the building. And the same thing is true in reverse. At the end of the day, when you know, the bell rings and you run out and you go to get to the bus, you basically just come right out and go, and go right, out, right out to your bus. So the amount of time you, you spend getting around the school is drastically condensed. 
um, d directly above this space, there's actually a little bit of a um, media center cafe. It's something actually out of the program, but um, it's a very sort of a multi-purpose space, you know, for the students to, to study, you know, to hang out. Um, kind of thing, and for, for those of you that have a child who insists on studying for midterms at Starbucks, I can tell you that this is probably a really good idea to have in this school. <laughs> so. Um, so now we get to really the heart of this whole thing, these, these, these educational communities. We have these educational communities located at the rear of the building, as I mentioned, for um, security reasons. Um, they are, the, as the program calls for, there are what are called learning communities. There are six of these learning communities. We've located two on each level. Um, so these are three-story wings of the building. And the media center is the hub of everything. It's the hub of learning. And the connection to the media center is very important for these educational communities to function. They're basically a collection of, of multidisciplinary classrooms. But one of the things that's very important about our design for these um, learning communities is that a, a breakout, co a collaborative learning breakout space is an important element of these learning communities. And what we've done is rather than locating that, that common space internal to the community, we've located it at the end of the communities. If you see here these kind of teal uh, spaces at the end of our community, is, is roughly classroom sized, so you could actually take an entire class of students and, and instruct them out in that communal area. They can also work there independently. This is basically the north side of the building, so you get this wonderful north light coming into that educational space. And then the, the kind of pinkish area just inside that with the curved wall, that's the, that's the faculty workroom. So the teachers, that's where the teachers have their own personal desks and things like that. And they have visibility out to that communal area for supervision. They get, they borrow the light in from the outside, comes all the way uh, through that communal space into their space, and basically makes the learning community a very you know, welcoming and inviting environment. As mentioned, the media center is the hub. The media center doesn't go all three stories. There's actually the whole art department on the third floor, which can actually harvest daylight from from through the roof for the art students that you need that kind of light. And then the media center is on levels one and two with obviously a very direct connection to these learning communities. This is an, there, here's an image showing you what that breakout space is. And you can see how wonderful and inviting it is. And you can see the teachers all in the glass cage behind, uh, you know, behind the space there. But basically, it, it becomes, it appears a little narrow in this rendering, but it's, a, you know, it's, it's roughly classroom sized as per um, you know, specification. This is another little interesting space that we were able to create. This is on the second level kind of directly behind the media center where it's a hinge. And you're looking through a wall out here to the roof of the tech ed. Tech ed is located in the center hinge on the back of the school. There's a tall tech ed courtyard out there where they could have vehicles or things like that. And this is the roof of that space. And what we've done is we've chosen to make it a green roof that can, can serve many functions. You can, this is a, like a little another little collaborative breakout area here behind the media center. But you can actually use the roof itself as a, as a learning environment in nice weather. The, and by being a green roof, it can provide educational um, components for people studying science or environmental uh, issues. It can, um, it can also, um, oh, I'm forgetting my words here. So it, it, it can function as that community space. It functions as a green roof, where actually it is a functional green roof, filtering rainwater coming off the roof of the building. Um, and would even just sort of educate the students a little bit about the concept of sustainability. Um, so this, now we, I, that I've given you the explanation of how everything works on the inside of the school, I really want to give you an idea of what the school looks like from the outside. And hopefully what you'll see is that we've designed a school that respects the past and the history of Farmington, 
but then also is looking to the future of Farmington and where we're going with, with this facility. You know, obviously it started at the main entrance, you know, the main uh, visitor parking lot, and we're moving around to the side, the faculty and student parking lot. The lighter area there is that field house that I mentioned, the athletic uh, facility. There's a covered walkway along that side. That's the bus drop off. You can see a bus parked there. That whole side would be lined with buses at early in the morning. The student entrance is this area here, this, this kind of Y-shaped plaza is the dedicated student entrance for students coming in either to team rooms or arriving at school. And then now we're moving around to the rear of the school where you see the actual academic towers that represent the school with the tech ed courtyard right there. There's obviously a little pond there which is a, another environmental learning um, experience that we've created um, at this facility. Oop. Ran again. So again, if you if you now now with a still image here, you can kind of digest the interior, the exterior of the building. Predominantly a masonry building. We're working with brick and you know limestone type accents, materials that are appropriate for the town that people are comfortable with. Arranged everything in a very compact and efficient scheme, much reduced footprint. Even though this school is quite a bit larger than the current school, the footprint is obviously quite s much smaller. And the roof itself allows us with a perfect place for photovoltaic field. Um, there were bubble skylights that were, if you, I don't know if you noticed them in the um, initial view as you walked in the front door, but you can see them up on the roof here, there's a series of little bubble skylights. And what we noticed as we were doing some computer modeling on the design is as the sunlight comes through those bubbles, it creates little circles on the floor of the common area, which you know, we were kind of looking at as whether, well, are they rocks in the river, are they bubbles of white water? You know, we can get all kinds of crazy uh, ideas of what they represent, but we really liked the, the uh, effect that we got with that, with the bubbles themselves. So now um, Angela Cahill, um, my project manager on the project, is going to kind of go through your, your uh, really interesting criteria slides. Yes, I get the fun part. Thank you, Dave. Um, so now that uh, Dave and Rusty have described the design in detail, um, let's recap the important parts of the design that we've created for our community um, by using the criteria slides. So, you know, given the freedom of a new building and um, our critical design decisions that we made in this process, we feel that we've met the criteria fully, but we'll, we'll walk you through those slides as a tool. Oh, do you mind? Thank you. So criteria one um, has to do with compliance and also security. Just again, want to highlight the security features of this building because we find those to be most important. Um, it's a well-defined perimeter. It's got the students' uh, uh, core classrooms in the rear, which is important for uh, keeping them away from the intruder. Uh, ha after hours lock off, which you can see with the bubbles, um, and also um, um, having uh, reduced perimeter access points, uh, greatly reduced from your existing building. Category two um, is about a lot of things, programmatic needs. Um, this slide shows um, construction phasing, as Rusty had uh, pointed out at the beginning. Um, but our basic um, premise here was not only were we allowing this building to be built while your existing building is occupied, thus minimizing the construction, total construction duration, but we were also very conservative on moving your athletic fields, so keeping, keeping that scope as, as little as possible. Um, sorry, can you just go back? One other thing, just again to reiterate, the, as far as the programmatic needs go, again, the, the collaboration space um, really provides that flexibility, that 21st century learning and project-based learning that your teachers are trying so hard to implement in this building, and they will be able to implement it in this design. Um, as far as category three goes, um, we talked about the reduction of the footprint. This footprint is a full 25,000 square feet smaller than your existing building. So there's a great reduction there. 
Um, the other thing we're very proud of with this design is that we were able to maximize your reimbursement because we're right on target with the square footage that the state is asking you to build for a high school facility. Um, so we're very proud of that efficiency that we were able to get out of the design. Travel distances are greatly reduced as well. Um, category four, building systems, it's really hard to summarize. So we've got a few slides at the end of the deck that'll be posted online um, to understand exactly how the building systems, mechanical systems are designed for this. Um, but we just, in summary, would like to say that this is an incredibly efficient building. It's a marriage between an, a, a very uh, insulated and protected envelope, which you need, to have along with your very efficient mechanical system. The two of those things go hand in hand. Um, we've implemented uh, a variety of sustainable and green features into these, this thoughtful mechanical design, the ability for a geothermal well and for photovoltaics. Um, and moving into the next phase, we would be able to run um, highly detailed energy models to be able to understand exactly what your efficiency is going to be and what the predicted operating costs are going to be as well. And we'd really love to work with, with the community moving forward on how green they want this building to be. Do we want to get you know, even carbon neutral? So um, there is that ability with this design. Um, site improvements, again, you know, really minimizing that athletic field um, impact, you know, meeting with the town planner and the town engineer and the police chief and the fire chief, we did get feedback from them that, you know, it would be quite disruptive to move that track, uh, really try to keep that in place. The tennis courts, those are relocated, but you know what? Where we've put them now is actually a better orientation for the play of tennis. Um, we kept that baseball field orientation, which is also the correct orientation to have for that sport. Um, and again, you see, um, just the, the idea of aligning that main entry to Monteith Drive and keeping those bus loops, uh, that bus loop separate from the parent drop off for, for extra security. Um, and then uh, the alternates really don't need to spend time on this. Uh, we, these are the same two alternates you've seen on the last two options. Take them or leave them. They're, we've had them priced out. Um, they would, you know, the design will work with or without them. It's just whether we, we, we would choose to have that dialogue about those features uh, in the next phase. Community. I think Dave said it right when this is a community building. These spaces uh, are for the entire community to enjoy. They're prefer, for performing arts. They're to keep your community healthy and fit. They're to continue to educate your community in their adulthood. Um, they're for social events and bringing people together. And also, it's for shelter. So um, we're really proud that this design will be able to serve the community so well. It's, uh, it's a vibrant, welcoming building and uh, really describes the future of Farmington. Um, so the last category is fit and fill for Farmington. Um, at QAM, we have an integrated approach to design. I'm not sure if you guys knew that. Um, we start uh, when, at the beginning of our designs, working with our interior designers. And that's essential, especially in educational design, because you need to lay out the spaces with furniture, uh, think about the finishes and the materials from a maintenance perspective, and, and have that integrated approach from day one. Um, also, in this uh, competition, we were asked to provide a level of detail that the estimators would be able to understand what the materials are. So here to speak about that is the head of our interior design department, Rebecca Sarkozy. Thank you, Angela. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to come to another presentation. Um, I think these renderings show the interiors so much better than I can describe, and I'm so proud of what our team has come up with to show you for these concepts and for the potential for your new building. Um, last week and the week before, you met Erica Roberts from my firm, who's another interior designer, who's been very involved in this project. And I think you can tell from our deliverables here in the presentation what our role has been and how collaborative we are at QA&M um, to work as a team to integrate the interiors early and throughout the phases, all the way through the ff &E, the furniture specifications, which are something, um, it's a part of the project that will further the flexibility and the uses of the public spaces and the student spaces. You'll see those elements throughout the renderings, and it really is an integral design here at QA&M. 
Um, I just want to talk about a couple key points in the interest of time. There's a lot that goes into the interior design portion of any project. Um, you have seen these dynamic finished boards presented. Tonight there is a new one that references the new common space, the riverfront theme. Um, Something that's important about those, those were included in the budget, they do represent our approach to the interior palette, which would be several considerations are given. Sustainability, obviously cost, safety, um, the aesthetics of them, and um, things like slip resistance. A lot goes into it, and what we do is we have presented one idea where we feature some initial palettes. We know that going forward it would be an integrative approach with you, the community, and the students to potentially refine the design and further fit with the fit and feel of Farmington. This is just one example of how we would present those images um, further with the actual um, material samples that you can feel. As we go forward in the conceptual design with the architects, we were really excited about this space to imagine what it's like to walk through these renderings. I think you would agree that you can almost step into these spaces. You can almost hear the cheer from the field house and you can almost overhear some of the performing arts, you know, a theater program going on as you're walking through that common space. Maybe you're getting something at the concession stand during intermission. You can really see that space activated. I think these renderings show these potential um, opportunities in a really great way. Um, again, it is a community building and we see tons of opportunity, um, not just for learning and instruction, but also for community events. Um, as we go forward, we not only would involve the community and the students, as I mentioned, but we see a true opportunity involving the curriculum um, that is so sophisticated here. It's almost a collegiate level. Um, we hear nothing but good things about the program, and that is why people have moved to Farmington. We see this building supporting that further and also integrating some of the design components with the students throughout our process. So things like different 3D modeling, like you see here, drafting classes, graphic design, 3D deliverables, um, engineering classes, We've supported mentoring programs for high school students, internships, shadow days. We like to get their unique perspective, um, definitely a fresh, relevant perspective for their own school. Um, we find it beneficial to them and to us, and it offers a really unique approach. Um, in closing for the interiors portion, um, I think together, if we work as a team and if we work with community, we can achieve our shared mission to create new possibilities for Farmington, not only for the students, but for the whole community. Thank you. And again, as far as the exterior design goes, you know, this is, we re really see this as a fresh start for the education for our school system here in Farmington. New futures will happen with this, with this design that we've created. It's primarily a masonry structure. It's a very secure building and it reflects the academic excellence that exists here in our school system. It references the history, the mills and the villages of Farmington while it looks forward to the future. So with that, Rusty would like to say some closing words. Thank you, Angela. So it's been a pretty intense two and a half months where we've all been working together pretty, you know, together and we've been working very hard together. And I want to thank everybody that's here, uh, especially the building committee, because it's not just us, it's all of us that have been working on this project. Uh, the key there is I want to I thank the building committee, the Board of Education, the community, students, because obviously students have participated in this process, um, and the parents. Everybody's interested in a new school, and I think uh, you know, all these options are really creative. They are informative, and it gives you some perspective on what the possibilities are. You know, from QAM side, and we've assigned some, our, all our senior staff, actually all three of the partners uh, in, at QAM have worked on this project. Our entire team, which is very creative and energetic, and they're young and they keep me on my toes, uh, but it's, it's wonderful to work with the young group of people, and, and that's what we bring to the project. We think uh, that we will provide you with solutions uh, that are out of the box, that are going to, to test you, but ultimately it comes down to the fact that you're gonna be making a really difficult decision. A decision that's gonna be probably one of the most difficult decisions for our community. Because having lived there here for such a long time and having gone through all the different changes on the school, I understand that. And that's important. Actually, some of the young kids here were really eloquent in what they said. And they stole some of my thunder, so I'm, I'm sure I'm not gonna say it as well as, as, as they would. But as an architect that specializes in educational architecture, 
Uh, one of the things that to me is an imperative is that the environment that we create for these students, it should be inspiring. It should be something that prepares them for a global job market that we're all dealing with. All our kids are gonna be dealing with that. And we've gotta provide them with the tools that are necessary to achieve that goal, that, that success in the global market. And really, to me, the school is just another tool so that, to achieve their goals. It's incumbent on us to, to do something to help them achieve that goal. You know, as, as I look back on, on, on this project, I think as members of this com uh, community, we need to understand our neighbors, we need to understand the priorities of our neighbors, and I believe that it's our goal and our charge to work with the community to come up with programs that really work for our community. So. We're really proud of what we produced, and with that, I want to just show a little a picture of our team. We were so excited. We thought, hey, it's about time all these people that nobody knows about that have been working behind the scenes uh, get some recognition. And I want to tell everybody, my partner, uh, Tom Markary, I don't think he was able to make it here today, but he has been an, a, a force in, in working with all these young students. So with that, just going to end with a another view of what could potentially be Farmington High School. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Chris Seikley, Construction Solutions Group, we're the owner's project manager here. So I'm quickly going to go through the budget for uh, this option presented to you by Quisenberry Arcarian uh, Malik. Um, so as you see at the bottom, uh, the total is 145 million. Uh, 305,460. What that comprises of starting from the top, uh, the architectural design fee. So as we've stated uh, previously, this fee, the 5,722,000, that was uh, the fee that Quisenberry um, had submitted during the initial uh, RFP process. Uh, so we're carrying that through for this option. Uh, the other professional fees, the $3 million, uh, that includes uh, project management fee, testing and inspections, uh, any move services uh, relative to this project, um, and so on, any of the other ancillary fees. The construction cost, the $122,230,000. That again represents the hard trade cost uh, that goes into the, this entire construction project, everything that you've seen here. Uh, the alternates, uh, as you've seen earlier, um, total about a million, $1,500,000, I'll round up. Uh, those are the widening of Monteith, about a million dollars, and then uh, the gravel access road, which is about $500,000 uh, in, in round numbers. The FF&E, the furniture, equipment, and technology, again, that's the same number as you saw from uh, option two, that, uh, that number, 5591000 represents uh, replacing all of the furniture in the building for the entire population, as well as uh, any of the technology upgrades that, that would go along with that. Uh, the owner's contingency, 5%, that number is 7250000 uh, So all of those values roll up to the 145305460 So as you can see here, the, the total project cost, $145 uh, we projected the reimbursement from the state to be $28,661,000. What that represents is uh, approximately 20% of the total eligible cost of the project would be reimbursed by the state. Um, for this project, the ineligible cost, uh, we were estimating about $2 million. So it's, it's fairly minimal. Um, so the majority of this project would be eligible for reimbursement and uh, Based on that, it would be 20%. So the net municipal cost to the town would be 116,644,000. 116 million, sorry. 644,000, there's a lot of numbers there. 368. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to keep going? Go ahead. So tax impact for this option um, would be $575.58 in year one to the average home assessed at 226,777. Costs will decrease by approximately $10.89 per year over 20 years. All right, uh, any questions from the committee? Thank you, Rusty. Uh, you know, one of the big op issues, obviously, is disruption to students. And the new school, at least theoretically, is a flip to switch kind of thing, which is nice. But can you just clarify if there's any disruption to learning and education? And then just talk about the disruption that's going to be the site issues. I mean, with parking, I mean, parking is a problem as it is. But if we're taking temporary space at the bottom of the hill and everything else. So if you can talk more about the disruption and then also sort of the time frames. You're, I don't think if I caught the time frames of this building. Certainly. So time frame wise, what we anticipate is that the new construction is going to be in the 22 month range and it can start at any time. Obviously, we do want to start in, in the spring uh, when we have good weather or in the summer. Um, the, the second phase, which is eight months, is really a function of what you're demolishing. Um, not only are we demolishing a high school building, but keep in mind that that building has hazmat in it. So that process gets prolonged as you demolish that building with hazmat versus if just if you're demolishing a, a, a building. We've done this many times, so we have examples of other projects. Uh, so we don't want to understate it because that is a, cr a critical component of this. Uh, in terms of the disruption itself, and at, and at the end of that, that time period, uh, it's in essence, the students will move into the new school really in 22 months. So school will begin to, to operate in that 22 months, 10, 22 months window, and the space that's around the school will be finished. So it's not that they're, the school was finished and the, the, the site is, is, is uh, uh, under construction. Actually, everything that we showed that was in, in the staging area would have been completed because they would move staging to the other side of the, of the site. So in 22 months, the students are in the new school, demolition would occur. Hopefully it could be timed in a way that the demolition starts in the summer months when nobody's in the school. So when the students come back to school uh, in September, uh, you know, they're not having to deal with that construction being so close. The disruption to education when the construction is on is usually one of, you know, how do you, where do you park? Uh, we've been through this in many districts throughout, throughout Connecticut. And the reality is uh, there's not going to be enough parking on this site. Let's, you know, just put that to bed right up front. And most communities understand that. They understand that this is a process, it's a temporary process. Parking at the high school is a privilege for students, so they're not required to have parking. And so what most schools do is they, they uh, give seniors the priority and then the juniors and so on. And, and that's fairly typical. We create temporary spark parking spaces. The goal is to have adequate parking for the teachers, the staff, and, and, and parents coming to the school. Uh, so there is that level of disruption. Additionally, access to the, to the track and, and the field, the football field, you're going around the building. Uh, and so there is a slight change in how one accesses the fields. But once again, if we go with a new school option, that's something that we need to be aware of and accept. We'd shown an alternate coming uh, uh, to the school as a, as, a, as a site access. And that could be an access point for, uh, on a, off of Highwood uh, for the buses, for instance, or for traffic on a temporary basis so that not everybody is coming in on, on Monteith. But if you notice in our site plan, we had very defined uh, uh, parameters and, and, and directions for where construction traffic would go and where bus and school traffic would go. Typically, you want to have separation between the building, uh, the existing building, and the new building. Uh, and that's going to be the challenge. We're going to have to create a barrier because there's sound construction noise that will come across um, and that we'll have to deal with. And we have to always maintain a safe environment for the students. So we'll put up, that's got to be a lot of emphasis. Typically, we sit down with the construction manager, with the administrators. We come up with the program from the very onset of the project and we make sure that that's adhered to. 
Uh, there are going to be instances when something happens that was not supposed to happen. But the, the key is to be proactive in that process and make sure that you address those issues right away. Uh, it will be disruptive not to, quote, education, uh, but to people coming to the site, leaving the site, uh, and to, uh, in, in terms of parking. I have a question, Rusty. Um, I was just noticing that the construction staging, which you guys have, uh, looks like it's created, is towards the, uh, our current field, the baseball field there, and yet your access, temporary access, emergency access is really across. So they have to, is that your plan as far as getting construction people in and out? They have to come from the? No, the, the, the construction access, if you, we had presented a, a site plan earlier on and, and that showed actually would come off Monteith, the, the construction vehicles would come off Monteith. That, that secondary access of high, off Highwood would be, could be used by, for instance, the school in this case. Um, so, and it's more for emergency purposes because now we've brought not just construction traffic onto the site, but we've also brought school traffic on site. And so we think it's prudent to do that. Um, from our discussions with the fire department, police department, everybody really thought that there was a good idea to have that regardless of what happens on the site uh, because there's really no well-defined way of getting off the site. I know there's accesses into the neighborhoods, but uh, this is a solution that, that everybody felt, felt would be a benefit to the community and yeah, the school. I see that now, That's yeah. your red arrow there. Um, another question I had was we, we struggle with the photovoltaic options that are, uh, you know, everyone is very, in the community is very, you know, we want to be, uh, you know, fiscally sound as far as how, what that option might be as well as, uh, you know, just not leaving a stone unturned is something that might be uh, uh, beneficial to our school and beneficial to the, to the uh, costing. Do you guys have any, any costs implemented about that photovoltaic and how the payoff would be and that, that type it, of thing? Because we struggle you with know, that. <laughs> The state was reimbursing school districts for, for photovoltaic, so everybody felt, let's jump on the bandwagon, let's do this. Really, to me, the test is that when you put uh, these systems on, you have to have people that maintain them, and, uh, and there's a cost associated with that initial cost as well. What's happening a lot now is power purchase agreements are being put in place as all these programs that the state has. Some of them are being phased out, so it's really a matter of time uh, in terms of when they can be implemented. But I like that approach because there's zero upfront cost to the community. Um, there's a negotiation on the actual power purchase component of it, uh, and, and then they're responsible for maintaining it. So it's a, it's a different way of approaching it. Um, and it minimizes the impact on taxpayers right up front because we've already. That's still available. I, I didn't know. There are some programs. They're they're phasing it out. So whether the, whether it'll be available at this at this time when the project, uh, we're not certain. But I think uh, new programs seem to emerge as time goes on, and I personally prefer that uh, that rather than adding it into the cost. If not, then we have we always have the option of adding the photovoltaics into the project. One more thing. I know that you said there's a 20, 22 month, I just want to understand it. The 22 month build out for the new building. Yeah. And then there would be the demolition process, which would take another eight months. Is that? Well, different? I'm looking at it in terms of not just the demolition of the building, but also the finish out of all the rest of the site. <clears throat> for instance, the, the, the JV uh, baseball field, uh, you really can't build a field and unless you're putting in artificial turf and then play on it that season. You need to let the field the, it grow uh, and usually the best thing to do is to let it grow for two seasons uh, before you start using the field. So we're trying to uh, be aware, you know, be conscious of that and not paint a picture that like, everything is available to you right away because that's really not true. Hi, Rusty. Can you just um, clarify the the purpose and the plan for the 1928 building? So, in in the base project, what we said is, um, and that's how the, the the budget is established, is the board of education and alternative education is on the second floor above the administrative areas in the new building. 
Um, we feel that that's an efficient way of doing it. And in our conversations, that was uh, a preference was expressed for that. So in that case, what we, we refer to with the 1928 building is we refer to it as future use. So in our budget, there is cost for uh, putting a uh, heating system in, making sure we maintain it, making sure we enclose it so it's, it's watertight, so it's not something that's, uh, you know, um, that's going to deteriorate, uh, but it's assigned as future use. Uh, an alternate to that is to place the Board of Education into that building, the Board of Education, but we won't use the entire building, so we did get an alternate to that uh, cost for that as well, which was a savings uh, in, in the budgeting process. And then we had a third alternate that said, uh, or a second alternate to that building that said, we'll just demolish it. Now, you know, that's something we need to tread lightly on. There's a lot of people that feel this is an iconic building to, to Farmington. Uh, and we don't need to, to, if we move forward with the project, you know, unnecessarily uh, erode support for, for a project. Um, if, if there's a, a way of using it, I mean, we certainly should try to use it, but if not, there is that option, and that's even a greater savings. Quick question, a couple quick questions. The, um, <clears throat> how would one enter to get into the alternate education space? Is that through the main entrance? And then no, the there's a, it's the same entrance as the, as the Board of Education, those two. Is a separation. Gotcha. Now, in discussion, you know, the administration you know, yeah. where they were okay with coming in through the main main access too. So there is an internal egress there that could also be an access point. But we were, we were taking that as a more literal because those students are coming and going uh, that they would they had a separate entrance. And a question on the massing on the right to the right side of the entrance, you have the theaters. And when you showed the video, is that side of the building reaching three stories over there? I know you've got the second story for the mezzanine, but it from a so in order to have a performing arts or theatrical um, a building, you need a fly loft, and the fly loft is typically a, a taller structure. That's what we have currently as sure. well. And so because you want to fly scenery, and that's what that reflects, that there is a section of the building that's, that's taller in, in that space. Do you have any elevations that show the height of the, um, the building from that side to its closest neighbors over there? Or anything that would give us a sense of perspective of how that transition might be? A couple, a couple of things we did, because we are concerned about the, uh, the neighborhood, uh, is there is some cut and fill that would occur on, on this side of in the site. So as we were developing the, the east side of the property where the neighborhood is, which would be most you know, impacted in, uh, to the great, greatest extent, we actually raised the grade. We were building a berm up there and then adding vegetation to it. So we would sort of, you know, having a heavier barrier, uh, a visually both sound visual between the two spaces. But those homes are actually the grade drops back there too, so those homes are lower. Uh, again, so that in some ways helps because the trees form that natural buffer for those homes. But the reality is, it is a it's a it's a fly loft for a, for an auditorium for a theater, and you know unless we do a modified loft, that that I don't think I don't think our community really wants that. If we're going to spend this kind of money, we want to do it right, uh, so that volume will be high. And then a question about the back with the tech ed. How would, um, is there a conception of how um, vehicles or, or, or any, any kind of heavy equipment that might need to be brought into that space, how that would enter or how, how that would interact with the tech ed space? So typically in technology education, let's say a construction lab or a automotive, I mean, what you're bringing in are cars. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the access road around the building is designed to be able to accommodate emergency vehicles. So that would bring that would be the access point to the build, to those locations. Uh, keep in mind that obviously we want to minimize traffic towards the back of the school. Uh, we want to you know again be respectful of the neighbors. So that is a just an emergency access, and those types of events don't occur that often. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Could you tell me, please, how many access points you would have to get into the building? 
So our main access, uh, the front of the building is the main access point mm -hmm. with the controls. And we do have the bus entry on, in the back of the building as well. But typically what would happen in a school is the students come in, to the, in into the, through that student entrance, and once they're in, that entrance is locked down. So okay. you don't go back out. So the main entrance is where everybody else would come after the students are in school. Uh, that's where they would be checked in. Now, just in case there's some reason for somebody to come in from the back, there's a secure vestibule there, and the SRO office is right there next to that. Thank you. Did you communicate? I may not have heard it. What the what the cost of carrying? What's the cost of carrying the 1928 building? In terms of demoing, the, I think one in one scenario it was about four hundred thousand, okay. and in the second scenario it was eight hundred thousand. Anything else from the committee at this time? No? All right. And just, just as a comment, um, both our buildings, even the renovation scheme, did allow for expansion. One may not be aware of how it happens, but we are. Uh, so we do provide expansion in both our options. Thank you. So we're just going to take about a five minute break. There is coffee in the back. Um, okay, I'm going to open the floor to TSKP for their presentation. Thank you very much. Once again, for the record, my name is Richard Zipek. I'm an architect and a partner with TSKP Studio. Uh, and we'll, with me this evening are my partner, Taisu Kim, who you'll hear from momentarily, Michael Scott, senior architect with my firm. Here, he's the guy with all the answers. Uh, we also have Hajar Alduri. She's a designer with my office, an aspiring young architect. Uh, Kara Gruss, who has helped prepare this material. And from our consultants, mechanical electrical plumbing engineers, Craig Raza, here in the front row, and Milo and McBroom's representative, Darren Overton, who they're here to answer any questions later on when we get to the <laughs> Q&A session. Um, so, like we did last time, I'm going to do some introductory comments, some introductory uh, uh, information for the benefit of the public, and then Taisu is going to walk you through the design, and then I'll wrap it up uh, when I go through the evaluation score sheet. Um, Taisu will take time walking you through the building, and so you should understand when an architect works on a project, he lives in that building for quite a period of time. So he's very intimate with it, and there are benefits that he wants to point out as he's walking you through it. So please, let's give him the time that he needs to actually explain <laughs> how the design will work. Okay, so a few introductory comments. Uh, thanks again to everybody who has participated. It has been a very interesting and very intense period of time. Again, tonight's only option three, and as a reminder, what we were told by the state is for new construction, you would be eligible for up to 20 cents per eligible dollar. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. You'll hear from CSG, they will report on the um, uh, expected reimbursables and then the, uh, or expected ineligibles, and then the um, roughly 19 or 20 cents of per dollar for for construction for the project. So um, in this option, which is the new building option for Farmington High School, uh, we were given this site, and we need to find a location on this site where we can build a new building and minimize disruption in the existing building uh, and all of the educational activities that go on. So we went through a process of trying to examine different parts of this site. I will share with you a diagram that we did quite a while ago because we have studied this 
uh, for quite some time. And our first impression when we visited the site was, gee, it makes sense to place a building here in the northwest corner of the, uh, I'm sorry, northeast corner of the parcel because that's where it could least disrupt um, activities on the existing school. And then when we had, uh, when we were selected to undertake the study, we had some executive sessions with the committee. And as a, re a reminder to the committee and for the benefit of the public, we looked at a variety of locations on this parcel. We looked on the upper plateau. We eliminated that as a possibility because it was too far removed from the play fields down below. We looked at placing the footprint of a building on the existing football field. Uh, then when we realized we would have to rebuild the football field elsewhere, plus potentially create a football field that would be very close to neighbors, that we eliminated as a possibility. And so then we focused on this corner of the parcel and we created a, a footprint in that location. But the challenge was to create as small a footprint as we can in order to minimize any impact on the neighbors and impact on the existing building. And that's what we have achieved, which you will see momentarily. But the strategy then was to, within that footprint, create on one side where the classrooms would be located, keep the building footprint about 150 feet away from the property line, and place the larger community spaces with a separate entrance facing on the opposite side. That way, all of the activity that occurs after hours would not be disruptive to the neighbors. And the classrooms, which would be silent at night and dark at night, again, this was the strategy that we took to zone the activities on the, the building. This rectangular building that you see here is the 900 wing. You'll see when we develop, when we show you the diagrams that Tyson will walk you through, that we're proposing to save the 900 wing and incorporate that footprint into the overall project. This section shows you the upper play field area on the right, the existing football field location, the proposed building and its distance 150 feet from the property line. Our strategy in working with Mylona McBroom, the landscape and site planners, is to create a berm that could create a visual screen between the building and the neighbors and heavily plant that area so that it would really grow into a, a quite a, an opaque screen. And a close-up of that, as you can see here, shows the relative sizes of uh, those features. 150 feet away, the building, the three-story classroom wing, is 44 feet high. Okay, at this point, I'll ask Taisu to walk us through the design, uh, and he has prepared some initial thoughts. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Good evening. Uh, my name is Taisu Kim. Uh, I'm going to uh, present uh, option three, uh, the new school concept design. Now, these five points uh, are important points uh, for me to developing this design. So, uh, so I like to make a presentation in this sequence. One of it. So, first one is sequence of construction, and second one is site improvements and plan organization and meeting the ed, uh, uh, specification in the last appearance. So let me start. Well, as Richard said, uh, we chose to develop the school. Am I, do I say, OK, here it is. It's, uh, am I orienting? Yes, yes, right, right here. There, here's uh, the road and this is the area where we developed and we thought that is most appropriate place and uh, and least disruptive so how do you start okay uh, we're gonna establish construction fence like this so this is quite away from existing uh, building even quite away from uh, uh, 2003 building and there is enough uh, land for staging for construction, so I think it's, it's relatively easy to construct. Uh, this is the building, about 246,000 square feet of three stories uh, building. And uh, uh, 
when this building is, is finished, then school student going to move from here to there. And uh, our estimate is that will be sometime summer of 2023. Now, uh, once student move uh, all to the uh, school, and you are going to start to uh, doing demolition. Now, what did we lose for this stage? We lost a uh, uh, tennis court and one ball field, and maybe about 120 uh, parking space. So we are uh, showing possibly you want to build temporary parking near library to accommodate that loss. So this is once you move uh, everybody in and then uh, demolish this existing building, this is what's left. New high school, 2003 building, and uh, this uh, first 1928 building. And I like to uh, remind you that this is not included in our scope, but uh, we, our site plan showing it's your decision whether you keep it or demolish it. So uh, once you uh, finish this, now you finish this uh, site development. And this is the way site look like. Here is a new building, and here is approaching uh, main road here. And you have a pedestrian walkway straight up front, and bus is one side, and parents pick up is all around here, and major parkings are here. So uh, uh, really, front is here, and, and uh, we believe it's really good to have a front bus and parent parking, major parking up front. And the side entrance here is a public entrance after hour, sideway here. And there is a, uh, uh, this building, as Richard said, uh, used as a central office uh, for administration. So their entrance is separate entrance here. And service entrance is back here and additional parking here. We are showing about 200, uh, no, 565 parkings and 22 buses here. And you see uh, there is a uh, roof load all around the uh, campus, and there is a linkage to uh, existing uh, road way here as an emergency exit. So uh, really uh, what you see here is a building is facing to the front. Uh, wonderful uh, introduction as you come up here, and I think we saved this building, and I, I believe this building really has a nice relationship between a new building, and then this is all uh, new fields are all one side, and we did gain one more field uh, of uh, softball uh, field right here, and uh, uh, the tennis court we're showing here. So uh, I think it's just wonderful coming up here to see a uh, building all up front, just like uh, any major uh, building should be. And also looking at all this open high ground and wooded uh, area all at, at once, I think it would be beautiful uh, campus. Here's a site model picture seeing from here that model uh, over there. And this is a, a model shot from the other side, looking at sideways. Here's a, uh, 1928 and 2003 building and parking here, all the fields are at one side. So next one is plan organization. Now, uh, the reason I put this one is we're going to rotate the floor plan to sideways. So often we co people confuse in the orientation. So you're going to, uh, main entrance is here, OK? So this is the side main entrance is now here. Now basically, a uh, key uh, organizing force of this plan is two axes. 
main entrance going right through the main street and look out outside view. Another axis is coming in from public uh, uh, access here, go through the uh, cafed area and look out this wooded area. The very simple idea of cross organization. One, oops, sorry. So one side of this main street is all classroom and the other side uh, is here is a gymnasium and auditorium. It's really support area. And this area is divided by this cafe area. So it's very simple, easy to understand, easy to navigate. Now, uh, I spent quite a bit of time to uh, uh, making sure all the plans are right and uh, all the spaces are allocated and right size and so on. Uh, and it all worked out. And I'm going to show you, uh, it's going to take a little time, but I'd like to show you around uh, uh, this school, how it's laid it out. The main entrance here, you know, bus is here, and pedestrian pickup is right here, same place. It is a spacious area of waiting for bus and so on. Now, this space is two stories high, skylighted, wonderful space. You're coming in. And to the right side, we have a, a learning common, one common here, and the other common, I call it a learning common one, learning common two, and each common has a seven classroom and two science room and additional uh, class, uh, classroom for other uses, and also teachers' uh, uh, workspace right in the middle. Now, the last piece here uh, is two stories. I, I, I said these are two, three stories high, and this is a two stories high. Now, at the end, we have uh, uh, alternative high school has its own separate entrance right here, and this houses a uh, tech area, wood, and uh, uh, older wood, and uh, this is, uh, what, uh, what is it? Robotic space is here. Now, this requires higher ceiling. So uh, that's why this is two stories high, and uh, it will have at least about 13 to 14 feet ceiling height. The other side of this main street, right off the main entrance, administration here, and uh, teacher's uh, lunch room here. And then you will see this cafeteria right here, and go further. This is a support area, and this is uh, 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 the culinary space connected right next to kitchen. Uh, and you come in from this side, public side, coming in here, you see this open cafe area, and one side, here is all gymnasium, uh, small auxiliary gym and the large gym, and built-in uh, uh, seats here, and this is, uh, is uh, openable, both uh, two together. And the other side of this uh, cafeteria is uh, direct access from here, auditorium here, and its support behind it. And then here is a theater walk and maybe a black box, has its own uh, entrance from this side, and then music room, a band, and choir. Now, I like to explain this uh, nature of this uh, cafeteria. It's really is it's community, uh, uh, commons or, or multi-purpose space. Really, I would call, if I call this is a plaza, uh, Main Street, I would call this is a plaza. It's everything happening, you know, parties, music going on, work, after work, and so on. It's a truly multi-purpose room serving this. It's, it's a wonderful space. Uh, you come up second floor through these stairs, and now you come to a, a, a common learning, uh, learning commons here, number three, number four, and here's the music, uh, the art space. Now, I said uh, it's higher ceiling, right? So we have to come up about three feet with a ramp or stair to this area, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, music, uh, the art class, and this is maker space right here. Now, uh, from cross from here, we have a uh, counselor's office all here. 
and then we have additional classrooms, uh, such as uh, uh, engineering science and computer rooms. And you look down from here, uh, uh, the, the cafeteria, and further go there, this is uh, the media. It's a center of this really active uh, circulation area. And as uh, we're showing a cafe and amphitheater, this is all uh, reading area. And then uh, this is uh, media uh, production space and an IT office. And we placed uh, special ed at this end. Uh, special ed offices all here, and we have four classrooms. And additional spe uh, special classrooms are uh, scattered al uh, along these other places, <coughs> like this, like this. Now, th third floor, we go up through these three stairs, and this are three, three, uh, uh, third floor. You come up this stair, and this is corridor, but you look down through this glass wall downstairs and natural light coming into entire this long corridor. And so it's the same uh, learning uh, common number five, number six, and this is a mid-level. Uh, we will have a green roof. As you come up, you'll be able to ac access from the stair to green roof. And uh, we told you this uh, uh, 900 wing uh, uh, place we are uh, saved and uh, we have uh, 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 expanded this uh, existing uh, outdoor uh, team rooms and including uh, uh, another locker to meet uh, Title IX requirement. And this is uh, 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 Central Office of Board of Ed we are using same entrance here. And I think relationship is just wonderful relationship. I know uh, uh, Farmington really wants to save this and I think we can save this and I think can be successfully integrated uh, in a new uh, campus. Now, meeting the educational uh, uh, spec. See, as I explained to you the, uh, the floor plan, really we showed all the floor plan uh, required in your specifications. It really meet all the same square footage. In some areas really exceed your uh, required square footage. And functions are right place to relation to interest and each other. Uh, many places are very flexible space multi-use, and promote really collaboration of learning. Now, I, I, I like to go a little more detail of this uh, learning uh, a common area. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, typical classroom plus two science room, and this is a special uh, classroom, uh, such as uh, special ed or other uh, special classroom. And teacher's work room is right in the middle, and breakout area is the interior located right here. And this teacher's uh, open look out to the public corridor and look into here. And we have a number of smaller classrooms uh, is also open this. And I show you an example of this. This is a breakout area uh, which we designed. Uh, it's very successful. Uh, this is teacher's uh, area looking right out and small classrooms and these are the classroom all around. It is just intimate but wonderful uh, breakout area. Students come out and, and socialize and collaborative learning. This is a typical classroom example and uh, uh, we introduce uh, uh, the luba sun control so that sun comes in very deep inside uh, uh, classroom. And you notice this, uh, all the furniture is on uh, ca uh, caster. So you can arrange very uh, easily in many different ways. So what's the building look like? i show you a number of uh, uh, perspective uh, here. And you come in from here, uh, main entrance come in here. This side is, left side is administration. 
and right side is this is a teacher's walk area and going into the uh, uh, the commons uh, uh, learning commons uh, uh, house and second floor uh, you go further this is cafeteria you're going in and there's a grand stair going upstairs and second floor repeat the same as this one teachers uh, uh, workspace up here and this is the third floor corridor I talked about so up there you can look uh, down this and also natural light going in there and this is a view from uh, this uh, corridor looking to the cafeteria uh, and uh, uh, this is the, the public entrance after uh, school hour and you see this is very transparent uh, media uh, reading rooms all around here and this side is uh, uh, it's an exit way from uh, auditorium now downstairs uh, this side is a auditorium entrance some nook and then this side is a gym's office and the gym's entrance and so you can see, you see this is a really hub of your school and works multi-purpose ways, a lobby, cafeteria, and uh, uh, many other activities. Now, I'm gonna show you uh, exterior. Uh, this is the aerial perspective. Uh, uh, Montes uh, Road is right here, and here is a, uh, the pedestrian mall in the middle, and bus is one side, and pa parent pick up the other side, and, and large uh, parking. And th this is a nine, 900 uh, building, and uh, uh, central office entrance is right here, uh, and uh, the service uh, entrance is back here, and this is the pre uh, entrance to public after Hour. I think it's, uh, it's going to be a really transformative uh, experience coming in and see this whole green space and fields are all together. And uh, this is, Richard talked about creating really good buffer between school and, uh, and the neighbors. This is a, a view from approaching pedestrian mall, bus, uh, parent pickup, the main entrance here, the wonderful uh, transparent glass tower. This is a major stair uh, and three levels of uh, learning commons. And this is uh, uh, the administration and uh, uh, this is a counsel counseling uh, space. And I think it really shows the inviting and, and forward-looking and, and open uh, new academic uh, building. Uh, now, I know uh, exterior is all, always subjective and uh, I understand <coughs> that and this uh, we, we did very quickly. Uh, we didn't have much time to work on uh, exterior. So really what we are looking for is uh, dialogue and input from you and we work together and come up with a mutually satisfactory uh, the result and, and that will be our next stage, schematic design, and I look forward to uh, working with that. With that, uh, uh, Richard, I can I turn over to Richard. So in order to get accurate costs, we did prepare drawings uh, that clearly illustrated all of the building components and their materials. We did a narrative description of all of the um, features that the building needs to include. That's always forwarded to an independent cost estimator. CSG will report that cost momentarily. But like I've done before, I've stolen the thunder ahead of time. And so I'm going to share with you where we are. Uh, we believe the project cost is $142 million. Hopefully they report the same number <laughs> at the end of the presentation. Um, we do have everything in this cost, and um, including uh, con con uh, owner's contingency, as you can see in this chart. 
for those of you who are keeping score across all of the options, uh, so the $142 million for option three, how does that compare with our proposal for option two? It's, it's more, as you can see, and that makes sense because we're building more new square footage, and as, as you could see by Taisu's description, there's significantly more site work that needed to be done. How does that compare with option one? Well, option one was 49.9 million, but that fell far short of meeting your needs uh, and your criteria. So the margin between option one and option two is quite significant, but the differential between option two and option three, even we were surprised that it's, it's not that significant. And uh, at the bottom you see where I originally said uh, you would be eligible for 30 cents per eligible dollar for reimbursement from the state. Um, if we subtract some ineligibles, I think we'll probably end up around 29%. Um, I believe CSG said earlier that's probably 20%. I rounded down, and I'm saying that maybe it's about 19 cents per eligible dollar. Uh, and we, what we did is we allocated where the money goes. If you compare the dollars being spent versus your statement of needs, I thought it would be good for you to see where those um, dollars are being spent. As you can see, quite a bit of money is being spent on meeting ADA and NIES requirements because in order to achieve that, we are building a new building. And so proportionally, if you look at what we had done for option two, it just makes sense to proportionally increase those numbers for option three. If you look at it from a building standpoint, you can see that in the 900 wing, our budget includes $5.9 million to renovate that building. Um, and then the other areas you can see, if you look at the previous diagrams that we did for the option two, you can see how this auditorium compares to the renovated auditorium, for example. Uh, but this auditorium is large. It meets your educational specifications. And then the, if I go through the criteria, you know me by now, you know how I'm going to score this. <laughs> Fours across every item in your list. And it stands to reason. I mean, if we can't achieve a four in a new building, we really haven't done a good job. And we can achieve a four all across the board. So looking at your score sheet, if we look at local, state, and federal requirements, we meet all of the accreditation and accessibility requirements. We also meet all of the security compliance requirements. We achieve public and private separation. You could see the public areas versus the educational areas. And, um, and we met the security needs, if I didn't say that. OK, schedule. Uh, we did prepare an extensive schedule. And then subsequently, we reported back to CSG when they asked us, can you elaborate more? And what we did is we did elaborate more on each of the option schedules, and we did submit that separately to the building committee. But for this option, option three, you can see that we've done this timeline, and it shows new construction taking 18 months and being completed in time for school in the year 2023. And then starting in that same summer, we would start demolition, and we would start renovation of the 900 wing we would finish up the site work and that portion of the project by the following summer, 2024. Now, if you compare all of the schedules that we did, and we did one for each option, it's an interesting thing to put them side by side. Typically, cost estimating is done to the midpoint of construction, and that's indeed what the cost estimator did, the independent estimator for this project as well. And by shifting or extending the duration here, starting without the need for portable classrooms, gives us an earlier start. So what happens is the midpoint of construction actually ends up being two months earlier. And when we had a debriefing with the cost estimator, we pointed that out, and he agreed that that could be a two-month savings. And so you can do the math. Two months savings at 4% per year is a significant amount of money. As far as meeting the ed specs is concerned, we meet the ed specs and then some. We actually go a little above your ed spec. That was something that we said earlier. Tyson mentioned that. And when we compare the ed specs, 
of 274,000. Look at our total building, 265,000 square feet. That includes the 900 wing. That's a very efficient plan. If we can achieve your ed specs, and we can, and do that in a very compact way, that helps reduce the cost of construction. We've met all of your undersized uh, learning space requirements. We've increased them. We've included the new cafeteria gym to meet all of your ed spec requirements. And we've created the kinds of collaborative learning spaces that you don't have right now. And we've added space for new and enhanced educational learning. And Taisu talked uh, about this learning community where partitions can be relocated or um, removed between classrooms, so you can have a large space, you can have a smaller space, and you can have a variety of, of learning spaces. Uh, the next category is consolidation of space. We've eliminated the sprawling layout. This will feel like a very compact building. Building systems are completely new, and it includes humidification and dehumidification, modular boiler system, energy recovery system. The entire envelope is brand new, and it will exceed, um, it will meet the Connecticut High Performance Building Standards, and we can talk about that should you want to pursue LEED. We can easily achieve LEED Silver or better, but the Connecticut High Performance Standards are LEED Silver. Uh, and green design can be easily added as add alternates. And what we did here is we indicated what's included in the base building and projected utility costs. Right now, you are spending in the current building approximately $328,000 per year for utility costs. This building, without adding any photovoltaics or geothermal, will cost $307,000. So there's a savings right off the bat just with the building that we're proposing. And that's for a larger building. That's 265,000 square feet versus your 218. And this new building is fully air conditioned, has complete ventilation, and, so, and you'll spend less for utility costs. Now below the line, which are additional, should you want to entertain those kinds of features, we could have ice storage. There, we project that that would be an eight year payback and at least uh, on the photovoltaic parts, we did an initial look at that, and fortunately, it didn't think that would be cost effective, but we can certainly look at that in greater detail during the schematic design phase. But those would be additional costs, uh, and we are estimating that photovoltaic array for this project would be roughly $4.7 million, and that's not in this uh, total cost at the moment. Site improvements, talk, uh, Taisu talked to you about all of the site improvements. We have definitely improved the traffic flow. We've reduced, we haven't reduced any athletic fields. In fact, we have new uh, athletic fields and we've added an athletic field. We've improved the site layout and everything is ADA compliant. Benefits to the community. I'm not sure Taisu mentioned that it is very <coughs> easily to divide this building into the public part available after hours versus the academic part, which you can easily close off and not have available after hours. It also lends itself very nicely to um, a shelter, so people can use this facility if necessary in the case of an emergency. They can get into the public spaces, and we can talk about features that may be included in that uh, during schematic design. But the building zones very nicely to accommodate that. Fit and feel for Farmington. Okay. People who know me know that I have a, an extensive postcard collection. And I like to collect postcards of Connecticut cities and towns because I think they are a great indicator of what the town thinks of itself and what it uses as imagery for itself. Um, and I looked through my box of postcards, and there's a lot of them, and I did find a postcard from Farmington. This is the Hillstead Museum. And then I had to do a search for a postcard of the high school. And this is the postcard that was done of the high school after 1928. And I was imagining what this building committee must have faced mm -hmm. in 1928. There was a high school boom 
going on at that time. It was after World War I, things were being changed, and suddenly uh, things like a rising population, immigrants, uh, immigrants arrive, arriving, and so they had considered state-of-the-art educational spaces, a laboratory, vocational training classroom in the basement, of course. But those kinds of things didn't exist in previous high schools or academic um, spaces because that was more privileged. So this became a new feature. And this building at that time, they considered things like central oil heating. You know, they were going to get away from coal-fired furnaces. They wanted to go modern. And there, a new invention had occurred at that time, thermostats. So they included that. Now, you're in a similar position. You're going to be building a building that can be occupied in the summer of 2023. 20, That's 95 years later. But you are grappling with what kind of building are we going to be building and what, sh what should it look like? I believe a modern looking building is appropriate, one that is looking forward. I th I'm sure that when the committee convened in prior to 1928, what were they thinking? What should we refer back to? Civil War era bu buildings? No, they wanted to build state of the art. And this was state of the art. And this was what was done throughout New England and throughout uh, the Midwest. So I believe the features that you're going to include, uh, building technologies and spaces for learning, are going to be different than the folks in 1928 uh, did. And I think in the end, there'll be a postcard of this building as well, because you're going to be very proud of it. And so this will end up fitting and feeling like a Farmington building. At that point, I think that wraps it up. And turning it over back to the committee. I'll start us off. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You got to you got to do the cost analysis. I'm sorry. Yes. Jumping the gun. My apologies. I was really anxious. <laughs> you really did steal my thunder. <laughs> Jump right over it. No. <laughs> so as you just saw, yes, the total project cost is 142 million, uh, 39,523. Um, the 5.7-ish million for the architectural design, again, that's what Taisu Kim or TSKP Studios submitted uh, with their initial RFP response. Professional fees, again, that's the same number uh, from the first option. Uh, construction costs, again, all the hard costs that are in here. There are no alternates. Uh, TSKP decided that through this option they were going to build everything into the base cost of the project. Um, so that's why that is zero. Again, the furniture fixtures and equipment, uh, that's the same number as well as the owner contingency. <clears throat> so again, total project cost, $142 million. Um, again, we assumed about $2 million would be ineligible, uh, giving the majority of the $142 million would be eligible for the 20% state reimbursement of approximately $28 million with a net project cost to the town of $114 million. 31,000? I can't say. 618. This option will have a tax impact of $562.75 in year one to the average home assessed at 226,777. Costs will decrease by approximately $10.66 per year over 20 years. Now, Garth, you can ask your question. <laughs> now, I, I, I feel like I should let someone else start because I was a little, little out of order. Um, my question for you, uh, Richard, I have a, you had a couple comments. One was the, I think you mentioned something about the size of the auditorium and the new being, is, was, it the, was it similar to the size of the auditorium and the renovate is new? Well, the renovate is new. We're confined by the building footprint, uh, and although we were able to insert a balcony in there. Uh, I can't remember what the square footage is. Uh, I'm turning but you were able to, in this view, there was only one level, is that right? Or is there two levels? There's two levels. Yes. That's There's two levels. Okay. So. I'm just going to jump in. Thank you. All right, Garth. Um, 
So the, the, the advantage in the um, options one and two was keeping the exterior envelope intact, which if you're going to try not to disrupt kids, try to keep the rain and, and uh, cold air out. Uh, but to get the capacity, we needed a mezzanine. This um, theater has the same seat count, but we use a, a modified seating arrangement that we've used in other similar facilities. So it's a, a gently sloping floor for half the house when you walk in at grade. And then back behind you is stadium seating, which actually egresses out to the second level. But that way you can hold a smaller event and it feels full or in a full blown you have great sight lines no matter what the the depth of the house is greatly reduced. Yeah, so you, so the you think that the obviously the new version has many more options and benefits than the old version it, or it the does. newer old version. It does. Okay. Um, one other th one thing I was mentioning was um, the operating cost difference between do you guys have any figures on the renovate as new versus the new. I'm, I'm you know, we're going to be, we're going to be grappling with that as far as what, what's, what's that benefit. Yeah, I think we did. And I think we may have inadvertently included it in the handout last time. So I didn't dwell on it in the presentation. Okay. <laughs> uh, also, one other thing, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. The, the number, yeah. I, it's either $20,000 uh, more a year to operate the renovate as new scheme. And that's, um, okay, so that's, quite that's just because you're, you're burdened by, by the, old, the old building. You can't get the high performance envelope that right. you really uh, want to have. That's, that's correct, because we're not doing new walls everywhere. We're keeping some existing walls. The, the, the last scheme included, though, the four point that price tag for the renovated is new included the PV in, in the number that you saw as a way to offset that electrical cost. And that more than offsets the increase and allows you to operate at a savings. Um, I can't remember the total savings, but it's considerable mm -hmm. for the option two. But it, we, we had to leverage the PV to do that. Okay. And this one, uh, I mentioned I had a question there about the PV. Uh, did you include that or not include that in this version? You did not include that. In option that. three, we did not include okay. Is there? Two. Can you give us the reasoning behind that? Um, yes, it was fairly expensive, and based upon our initial examination of it, the payback was significantly longer. So we thought, why burden this? So I think it was a $4.7 million yep. dollar number right. in my presentation. We thought, why burden that now? It's certainly a discussion that we should have um, should you want to do that? And I think, I think a more refined analysis of it is warranted. Craig is here. I don't know if Craig, you want to add anything? If the town ends up purchasing the PV, that's where that $4.7 million comes. If you do opt to go with a PPE, there would be no cost outlay to the town. What's and a PPE? Uh, purchase power agreement. I, I know. Or PPA, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there'd be no cost to the town at that particular point. Programs are still available. Uh, they would take full benefit of maintenance. They take all the tax breaks. They take all the renewable energy credits. If you take the 4.7 and pay for it, you can get renewable energy credits, but you don't get the tax benefits of, of the PVRA being a, being a, a public place. So that is, that's one, one way of looking at it. And programs are expected to terminate uh, in the near future. but. As anything, with all these energy efficiency programs, something else rolls in their place and, and will take its place. One last question. Sorry. Um, the cost of the 900 wing renovation you have is 5.9 million. Um, looking upon something like that, I know we were t putting the uh, Board of Education, I believe, space in there, and we got some, uh, some of the spaces for the athletic facilities. Did you guys look into if, I know I want to, it's nice that we save something that we still have, we're paying on, stuff like that, but if we knock that down and added on a section a little bit more space to the new building, does, you know what I mean? You know, is, am I getting, g gathering, getting in the right question here? Yeah, is, that a, is there a benefit to did, keeping that or is there? We, we think there's a benefit to keeping it for a couple of reasons. One, it puts, puts the, um, the field house functions close to the field house uh, or closer to the field. The second is, it's still a decent building. It's, it's only, in fact, you're not 
you haven't fully paid for it yet. So but maybe by the time this building is built, it will be paid for. But still, it's a relatively new building. Why not fit it out? It will have new mechanical systems that we're proposing to do that will be upgraded. And we're completely fitting it out for central office. For the record, it's not Board of Ed. It's central office, which has a lot of staff, professional um, people. So central office could be located in that building quite nicely. And I had alluded to something at an executive session once before. I've seen a situation where having the superintendent in the school may not work that well because having the superintendent who's in, who's in charge of all of the schools in a separate building may actually function better. Um, and I say that because if you put both the principal and the superintendent in the same building, who's really the boss of that building? <laughs> I'm just saying, I've seen it happen. <laughs> Thank you. Question on um, the comparison again of option two to option three here. With the ad alternates, you've got uh, 5.6 of ad alternates, but you're mentioning that 4.7 of the PV uh, is the PV project. What's the difference there? What's the delta between that? Or, or, or is it fair? Are we looking at the 5.6 as the total um, component of what the PV would be with other pieces? The, there were some other alternates okay. in addition to the photovoltaics. Um, trying to remember what they were. Yeah, I, can, okay. I, I, I can run through real you, quick. You should just stand here with me. <laughs> um, we'll just start answering in rounds. And um, no, uh, so option two included um, the improvements to Monteith uh, Avenue, the emergency access, and improvements to Route 4 that the town engineering department Sounds like uh, around one five for those other right, road right. entrance improvements. Okay. So in this option, um, we unplugged the improvements to Route Four. Um, in reality, that's not going to be reimbursable right. under the state school construction grant. And um, if you look at what um, the state OSTA is going to do, make you go through, you'll want to decouple it from this project just so you can get started as early as possible. Anyhow. We went ahead and rolled in the emergency access into the base bid. We said, look, we've said it. This is the third time we're saying it to you. Everyone agrees it's a good idea. It's just base bid. Uh, and then the PVs, um, again, it's something, it's hard to imagine a new school with no PVs nowadays, to be honest with you. You know, you don't have to do full PV, PVs, but, um, but that said, because the existing, the baseline was so efficient, there was really no driving factor. We, we're not going to make that decision for you. Uh, we'll give you the data, and then we'll talk about it in schematic design. Is there an option that the town could pursue if they did not wish to do the PV panels in either of your option two or option three, that in subsequent years they could revisit that, given the efficiency of those systems at that point in time and the rate of return, and, and do it as a later separate project? Absolutely. In fact, uh, built into these numbers is the capacity to tie in whatever future photovoltaics would be added at some future date. We've done this on project. It's pretty standard these days. And the other question is somewhat similar. You, you mentioned that there could be, and I, I think I heard it, that there could be an ad alternate if you wanted to do a uh, lead silver. Did you identify what you thought that uh, expense would be if that was an alternate? I, I did not uh, indicate what that would be. Um, we have to build according to Connecticut high performance standards, which by definition could be lead silver. In other words, the state will accept either their guidelines for high performance schools or lead silver. They'll accept either one. It's similar. So by default, you're getting lead silver. So the only premium that you would have to add is filing for um, LEED certification and then demonstrating through um, evidence that's submitted by the contractor that he has fulfilled things like recyclable material, uh, proper disposable of waste in, 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 uh, and for disposable streams, uh, not streams, but, you know, waste streams. Um, <laughs> so, um, 
And that premium, it could be $50,000, roughly. And is, is there an economic advantage other than, than uh, uh, obtaining that? Is there some other benefit that would inure to the town to have that? Personally, no. Okay. Thank you. Richard, I have a question on um, building systems. Understanding that this is a conceptual uh, design and it shows on your um, slide, there's modular systems, they look like, um, they look like air-cooled chillers. Um, so I, I understand that and above it looks like maybe condensing boilers and I see the ERUs over here. But uh, the delivery system, what are you thinking um, for that? Are you thinking duct work with VAVs or how would you deliver that hot and cool water to the spaces? I'll ask Craig Raza, call her on now. We looked at a uh, variable volume system as a baseline building to all the prices and then we, we mer merit options from there to uh, put chill beams in or geothermal or ice storage, and we put in costs associated with that on the slides as potential paybacks and energy savings over the life of the project to see how each would benefit. We just started with a baseline and schematic just to see where it would come out, see where the pricing would be, and then kind of worked from there to come up with um, uh, the values and savings at this point. But that's what the baseline option includes. Uh, VAV for all the classrooms and variable constant volume for all the common spaces such as auditorium, gymnasium, uh, all those that also have heat recovery as well based on the population uh, in there. So is that piping for distribution or ductwork? Uh, it's, it's ductwork for air distribution but hydronically cooled and heated with piping distribution. Two air handlers to feed cool air and hot air through systems as well as radiation and or radiant panels for comfort. So there'd be coils to variable air volume boxes and, and, and it, so it'd be just ductwork for the ventilation? Yes, ventilation okay. would be uh, through the ductwork, correct. Okay. okay, thanks. I'm glad I brought my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the committee at this time? Mine is a question more to the committee than to um, be, you know, helpful having the audience of, of each of the people here. The concern that I'd, I'd raise is in our analysis of cost of each of the three options submitted by each of the architects. We have, and I know it probably at our next meeting, we may have the amounts that um, uh, Taisu K has um, offered at least on option two, and I think on option three, the um, effect of the energy costs. And to have that, are we assuming that that will be part of what we'll see next week? So the, the one thing that I would, um, I'd, I'd, I'd offer as, as an opportunity, um, this body has a finance subcommittee meeting, and I think it would be helpful for uh, that committee to meet to uh, review each of those components to make certain that we are vetting that sort of pre um, the, the full board looking at that. And, and, and the reason why I offer that is a little bit of um, the opportunity to learn from our history and not to repeat sort of where we've been in the past. And part of that comes from how we are um, offering the analysis of what the uh, impact of each of these projects would be to citizens the uh, town had engaged a different committee uh, and that committee produced a report that they had offered to both the town council and to the board of ed uh, approximately a year ago and the intention for how uh, financing would of this project would impact taxes was taken in total to um, how we anticipate uh, our operating budgets to increase over the next 10 years how we know our debt service schedules to be over the next 10 years, and how we can, um, with prudence and, and good thought, plan for other capital projects in addition to this one. That analysis was done with the town financial uh, director and with the town manager and uh, members of, 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 of different citizens in the, in the community. 
and they came up with uh, what I think is a very thorough and comprehensive review of all those things. I think it would be helpful for any time that we're communicating to the public what we anticipate the cost of this project to be to taxpayers in the totality of everything would be useful um, in, in terms of reviewing the costs. What we're looking at here is useful only in the purpose of comparing one to another, but it is fair to say that the numbers that we're looking at here would not be, in fact, what um, would be the impact to taxpayers. And, and the reason I bring this up is that a thorough analysis of that was done by our financial director, and he offered very smart, um, responsible ways of how we can be financing this, and they're not included. I don't believe they're included in the numbers that we're looking at over the past three weeks. So I think it would be prudent for us to revisit that to make certain that when we do offer information to anyone who's listening, that they get a clear picture of what the, um, the impact of this project will be in balance to the impact of all the things, because ultimately uh, people should have a very clear understanding of how this will affect their taxes in the totality of everything that we're looking at in terms of um, this project and in the balance of all other town projects. And just to jump in, Michael, that is actually being done by the town council next Tuesday, the 28th, at 7 o'clock in town council chambers. Um, they will be getting a financial presentation from the finance director looking at just that, a comprehensive look at the town's debt and upcoming capital projects and operating budget because um, they, they are the financial authority. So again, next Tuesday, the 28th at 7 o'clock. I, I still think I'd, I'd, it would be helpful to represent the way that um, those recommendations that were put forward to how we um, analyze the cost to taxpayers in our presentation so that the two actually say the same thing. I'm concerned that we're not following those recommendations and I, I don't think it would it'd be confusing to the community if they're seeing the numbers that we're presenting here and they may look different if the town council follows the recommendations of that other committee. That's my, uh, my reason for bringing that up. Yeah, I don't think any of our goal here is to, to cause confusion between us and town council or board of ed or any of us that are in this as a, a collective um, you know, a community effort to get this done and get a, a comprehensive solution and, and something that makes sense both financially and also meets the needs overall. So we certainly are going to use all our resources in order to make sure that we have a, a very transparent and consistent communication, um, balancing that with, you know, understanding we've got conceptual options we're dealing with and how does that translate into real numbers in real time and what that really means. So again, we want to represent numbers that are accurate to the best of our ability. We don't want to over-represent. We don't want to under-represent. So I think if we take all those things in context and working together, so taking, you know, we also know there's budgeting processes going on all over the place right now with the town. So the Board of Ed is, in, is uh, working on their process as well as town council is in the middle of that process as well. And we're a piece of that puzzle, um, as Michael is mentioning, we definitely are a large piece of that puzzle and we understand that. So it is important to us to make sure that it's all taken in context. And we can bring the knowledge that we've gained over the last, since last March, believe it or not, that we've been working on it, as well as the two and a half months we've been working with the architects and even longer with CSG with that knowledge and kind of really come up with a, a good representation that we can hand over to town council combined with their knowledge working towards that net new municipal cost range that we keep talking about. So they're going to help us with that process. As a charged committee of that larger town council committee, that's, that's how those two roles work together. So I think there's definitely components of this, and I think, I think we're working in the, in the right direction. Do you think that. we'd have that, we, so that, that analysis would be shared next week at town council? Correct. Okay. Yes. So then we'll yes. have that. As yes. we deliberate on the 29th. Then. Correct, yes. We'll have that information. Um, the town council, is, as Kat mentioned, we've been trying to stage this accordingly. A lot of information going on at one time, which is good and bad, um, because a lot of the people you see at this table will also be at all those meetings as well, which is good. Um, sharing communication, having the right people in the room, a very important part of the process. So building on that knowledge as we move along, I think, is super important. And putting all the pieces I bring it up together. Is that, that, that work that has been done for the benefit of anybody who's here tonight or, or listening 
is incredibly thorough and uh, will be very valuable to anybody trying to analyze the impact of this as well as the impact of all other um, financial obligations of the town. Any other questions from the committee at this time? No? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I open it up to public comment, um, just to wrap up the presentations again, thank you for the time today. Um, but I just wanted to say a thank you as well um, to our professional partners who have helped us through this process uh, for the last, as you've heard, um, about two and a half months of very intense work together in executive sessions, outside of executive sessions. If you've seen working meetings with the committee that we've sat together to come up with evaluation criteria that makes sense. Um, but if I could just ask um, the architect firm, architectural firms, CSG to stand up, just so you know the number of people <laughs> that have been involved in this process. Um, and you know, we appreciate the effort if you guys could just uh, stand up the committee as well, just so I think it's good to see a visual representation of the number of people that have worked on this so far, um, just a piece of it. But um, it's, again, we just want to say thank you as a committee um, and as a community to, to the amount of work and effort that's gone into this. So we really do appreciate that. Um, and another couple quick notes, too, before we move to the second public comment. Um, reminder that the presentation materials that you saw tonight, sometimes those numbers are very small. Um, everything is up on the website. Uh, for all three options now. So that includes all the presentation material, all the financial material that was presented today, everything is up there. So you now have the ability to see the full scope of work and uh, do comparison as well. Uh, if you want to flip through all the pages and take a look, um, but obviously that'll be the material uh, that we will be using in addition to all the other conversations that we've had um, as we move into kind of deliberation on these options at that point. So. Um, please go ahead and take a look at that. Reminder, the community um, meeting that we have scheduled for Saturday. Uh, and just another final note, just remember again that we will not be coming out of um, executive session with a recommendation tonight. We again are going to be having a conversation about this, these third um, this options that we just heard tonight um, and, and kind of get some more information and think more about those. Um, and then obviously we'll talk a little bit more about what our um, meeting will look like next week as well. So you'll, you'll see more information from us on that as far as how, what the agenda looks like and what, what it's going to look like when we actually present the, the recommendation. So um, at this time, I will open it up to public comment. Tim Kelly, 62 Westview Terrace. Um, I'm not here to campaign for any solution, really just to listen, but um, this might go more to the architects. I've noticed that in each of the designs tonight, you've combined the two separate gyms into one sort of mega gym, which is a good approach because now you have a larger, more flexible area you can work with. Uh, my only observation is we should, if we're gonna invest this kind of money, uh, try to always get something more than what we had before. So instead of just having a classic gym alignment for basketball, volleyball, wrestling, et cetera. I think if we look closely, we might be able to uh, install an indoor running track as well. And so that might be something worth taking a look at for the use of the team here, as well as uh, perhaps for the community. So they have that in places like Bulkley High School and Glastonbury, et cetera. I think some of you have seen those. Uh, the best, uh, most recent example to go look at is go take a peek at the new rec center at CCSU um, because that was just completed and opened uh, this month and they have a configuration that looks very similar to what we saw here and we're able to incorporate that creatively in, in a couple ways. So again, just as something that we might be able to do and I realize this was just the first cut 
uh, and there will be a lot more work done in the next phase. Thank you. Hi, Steve Lammer from 86 Norwood. I'll, I'll keep this brief because I want to go home too. Um, just a couple of things kind of over the past couple of weeks that we've kind of, you know, I, I applaud the architects. I know you had a lot of work to do in a short amount of time, so I, I kind of applaud you for what you guys have done, um, and I appreciated your presentations. Okay. Um, I also go out to the building committee. Your work ahead of you is, I, do, I don't envy you. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, but a couple of things is I'm glad, uh, Michael, you mentioned about the financing and about responsibly financing this project and kind of how that fits in with the rest of the town projects and all that because I think that is really the crux of what we're dealing with right now is is the price tag of how is that going to impact me as a taxpayer the people out that are sitting here and the people that aren't here that have kind of already made up their vote they made up their vote last time they're gonna vote no this time and that's the way they're going to be that's the people that we need to reach. We need to educate the people. Um, we need to get them to the building on Saturday. Have them walk through. And I don't know how many people were here or actually did that walk through. I did that walk through the very first. It was very eye opening. Um, you kind of understand the student perspective, the teacher perspective, um, and kind of you look at it from the town perspective in a little way. So that's kind of ultimately that. The other thing there that I've kind of heard a little chatter here and there about um, still was about the site and why didn't we have another site? We did. They looked at that. It's not fiscally responsible to do that. And if we were to do that, we're years down the road. It's not responsible to do that. Um, the next thing is what about there was some chat a little bit about uh, the photo for day excels whether that's an option do we have to buy into it now is it an option for later you know some of those things that's a potential that i think the building committee is going to have to deal with in terms of if this ever goes up to a referendum is there a potential that we have what i worry about is these the all or nothing if we either have this or nothing and that's it there's no choice and people like choice um so is there a way that we can go, we can get a new building? These other things are optional. They're not essential, but it would be nice to have these. Do you, do you want photovoltaic cells? Do you want this? Or is this something we revisit later? Um, that comes into like the schematic of do we prepare for that now? Do we, how do we kind of incorporate that in of future things? Um, when I look at the price tag, I mean, you had the low value of about 50 million, and then this upper of, of today's were a little over 100. Double the price, new high school. It, the option seems clear to me what one to choose, but you know, that's. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. That's kind of what I've kind of surmised over today. But you know, I, I think the building committee, you have a lot in the finance committee. I think the answers that you guys are going to get and, and come with, I think that's going to be. Um, forthcoming. So, all right, thank you. Hi, I'm Kristen Kirsch of 28 Orchard Road. Um, I currently have a sixth grader, a third grader, and God help me, a 2020 entering kindergartner. <laughs> start tears um, but yet last night we've a bunch of meetings with this with uh, vision of the graduate um, and having attended that meeting last night and seeing what the town's vision of the graduate looks like um, there were great goals great objectives and I'm sure there's somewhere but the how was not presented to us so as you guys look at the three different models that are presented I beg of you to look at the how that vision is going to be achieved for our kids through our 12th graders right down to my entering kindergartner because I'd like to not come back here in 10 years trying to fix band-aids and ceiling tiles and bathrooms and locker rooms when the power goes out for 15 days because of an ice storm. Everyone remember 2011? <laughs> it's fun times, right? 
Um, but you know, areas for case studies, for hands-on learning, for collaborative spaces, for technology, real-world application processes for our kids who might not be going to college but are going into the VOTEC sections. We're trying to have a spot for all of those kids. I have a neighbor whose son left Farmington as a second semester sophomore in college because of what Farmington allows our students to learn and achieve. So in terms of these price tags, like they saved a year and a half of college funds. So, you know, where's the offsetting cost for our taxes going up a little bit with $30,000 being saved or $50,000 being saved for college tuitions? Um, um, so just taking into consideration the whole student, our athletic facilities, our collaborative spaces, those classrooms, the cafeterias, just that whole space across all three models and how you're looking at what the graduate, what we're looking at across all of those curriculums, all those grade levels, and what we're hoping to achieve with this new building. New building. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm Amy Rosenfield. I live at Two Candlewood Lane. I have four children that have gone through Farmington schools. I have a 2012 graduate, a 2015 graduate, a 2018 graduate, and I have a fifth grader. And my kids complained constantly about the building, and I've, you've heard all those complaints. The thing that surprised me most that I heard tonight is something I hadn't considered about losing accreditation in our building that our kids would not have access to scholarship money. I found that really surprising and upsetting and I hope that when we take the, the we want of course, nobody wants their taxes to go up of course and we want to be fiscally responsible but how responsible is it to our kids to not give them a space where they can learn safely in a good environment and not have access to those to those to scholarships and to, to money for college. I also had a ch one child graduate in three and a half years because of, from college, we saved an entire semester because of the great education that child got here. My 2018 graduates on the same track. You know, my 2015 took an extra semester, that's fine. <laughs> it's okay. But I just want our kids to, I want my fifth grader, it surprises me, she, may not get a building if this doesn't pass. My fifth grader could be in the same situation as my other kids and I would like, I don't think that that's, we're doing a fair thing to our kids and I don't think it's, when I hear people wouldn't move to our town because of our high school and the people that we'll lose in our community, I think it's, we're doing a disservice to our community to not make sure those things are adequately expressed to the voting public. Thank you. I'll be real quick. Uh, Matt Dayton, Sunday Alpine. I really just have two points. Um, to everyone on this side of the room, we have to get the word out. You know, tell everyone, tell your friends, e email the soccer team. Let everybody know how important this is and what you've learned. And too many people, I think, are already had their mind up and it's not their job, it, it's our job to let everyone know how important this is and what we've learned. And to you guys, um, basically hiss in the mouth with the hard data. You know, let us know what it costs. Michael, you kind of were getting to it. Um, what it's gonna cost, what the taxes are. Um, I've heard that South Windsor's real estate taxes, uh, it's not taxes, real estate value, went through the roof with their new uh, high school. Let us, you know, is that information out there? Hit, hit, hit us with that so we, we know, possibly would persuade people to you know, vote for whatever decision you guys feel is best because you guys have been through it, you put the time in, the effort in to make the right decision for this town. Thank you.
Hi, Erin Ross Moses, 33 High Street. Um, I am a lifelong educator, started in higher education at Columbia University um, and went down to secondary education because I like that age group better. I have three children, a 15 year old, a ninth grader, um, a seventh grader who is 13 and a, a sixth grader who is 11. Um, and two of my children, one is outplaced um, because of special education needs and two that are in the district and um, one that has a 504, so also has special education needs. Um, I'm also the wife of a CFO of a bank, so I'm also concerned about finances and the fiscal responsibility to the town. I'm concerned about my property value. Um, I'm concerned about the the capacity for us to maintain our property value if we lose accreditation. Um, certainly people look at those things and we've heard it. Um, but I really, you know, it is our job as the people sitting in the room um, to educate those who are not here. Um, but I want to implore the building committee and the, the communication subcommittee um, that what Michael is talking about, and I know my husband was here a few weeks ago talking about, you have to focus on educating the public about how much this is going to cost a town, how much it costs on average in Massachusetts. I spent 10 minutes doing research and found that number. This is not rocket science. It's financial science, but it's not rocket science, and it needs to be out there. Those numbers need to not be shocking for them. Um, and we need to have that now, and it needs to be a priority. It cannot be coming down the path later. The hard work of doing that needs to be out there, and it needs to be out there yesterday, or else this will not pass. And it's tedious, and it's obnoxious, but it has to be done, and it has to be shouted from the rooftops in every single communication to the town. There needs to be a special communication to the town. We need to make the investment or it will not pass. And all of this work that these poor people have done over the last months and all of this time that you have spent and we have all spent will not matter because my children who will be living through the renovation for their educational high school experience you know, if, if it passes, it will not, you know, they'll be, who knows, w the town will have to be paying tuition at Avon because we'll lose our accreditation for our children. That's what's going to happen. And so this is the seriousness of it to our pocketbooks as real estate investors in this town is, is, is significant. And we need to, we need to make the investment in the communications now. Thank you. starting to zone out. <laughs> I'm sure of that. And I have pages of things I was going to say, but I'm going to skip all of them. And the reason I'm going to is the only thing that I want to say is, first of all, thank you to all of you. You've done an excellent job. You truly have. But what I really want to say is they're going to hit a blackout period where they're not going to be able to continue to communicate with us. It's our job <coughs> to make sure this gets out. I agree with you 100%. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. But it's our job. It's our jobs as community and as parents and grandparents to make sure this message gets out. And we go to our neighbors and we make sure they vote. If you looked at the voting records of this last referendum for this high school, I was on that building committee, proudly on that building committee. If you looked to see who voted, we didn't vote, guys. And there was misinformation. It's up to us to make sure we get the right information. They're going to give it to us. That's their job. That's their charge. They'll give it to us. The town council will do their work. The board of ed has done their work. The building committee is doing their work. But we have got to thank God for FHS, comprehensive, comprehensive HFS. I'm sorry. I'm saying it backwards. But tell your neighbors and bring them to the polls and make sure they're voting. And, may, and make those calls right up to 8 o'clock because they're going to hit a blackout period and they're not going to be able to continue to talk to us about this. We've got to do this, guys. We do. Any other public comment at this time?
right, so at this time, I'm going to ask for a motion for us to move to executive session to review and discuss RFP responses for architectural services. This is in accordance with section 1-206 and 1-210B24. Second. Second. Is there Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right.